Zachary DeWolf. Thank you for being here today. I'm now calling a May 27th, 2020 regular board meeting to order. We live and serve in a city that is the ancestral homeland to the Duwamish people, Muckleshoot Nation, and Suquamish Nation. We acknowledge them as custodians of this land since time immemorial, as guests, and in many of our cases, as settlers on this land. We extend our deepest gratitude and respect to their ancestors and elders past, present, and future. Now we'll uh, move to roll call. Ms. Wilson-Jones, the roll call, please. Director Hampson. Here. Director Harris. Here. Uh, Director Hersey. Director Hersey. I think Director Hersey has just joined. Um, we're just calling roll. Director Hersey. I'll come back in a moment to Director Hersey. Uh, Director Mack. Here. Director Rankin. Director Rankin. Dr um, Director Rivera Smith. Here. Um, Director DeWolf. Here. And then I think now we have Director Rankin, are you there? Yep, I'm here. And Director Hersey, are you there? We are having trouble hearing Director Hersey, but I can see he is. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. And so that, that's all the directors on the line now. Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. And welcome directors and, and staff. Um, Superintendent Juneau is also joining us for today's meeting and additional staff will be briefing the board as we move through the agenda. This meeting is being held remotely consistent with the governor's March 24th, 2020 proclamation prohibiting meetings such as this one from being held in person. And I'll note that members of the public may also be joining by phone or online streaming. I will not be asking members of the public to identify themselves Thank you to those of you for joining us. As stated on the agenda, there will not be a public comment opportunity today for per the board policy uh, per the board's March 11, 2020 vote to waive relevant provisions of board policy 1430 and board pr procedure 1430BP, as well as board resolution 2019/20-29. Public comments are always invited by email to the board by fax okay. and by the agenda. I know we've received uh, a handful in our emails. To facilitate this meeting, I will ask all participants to ensure that you are muted when you are not speaking. Staff may be muting participants to address feedback and ensure we can hear directors and staff. Uh, and just as a personal note, uh, we do have a rather um, packed agenda, so uh, uh, let's just dive right in. Uh, I will now turn it over to Superintendent Juneau for her comments. Uh, thank you, President DeWolf. Um, I just want to first start by thanking Dr. Scarlett and her team for putting together the policy 0030 report and sharing it at the executive committee last week. Uh, that report will be posting soon for all to see. Um, second, I know there, I heard there was some interest in um, talking about a resolution um, declaring the first Friday in June to be National Gun Violence Awareness Day and there was not enough time to get it on this agenda to uh, be vetted by the full board. So I am going to read it, uh, the resolution, and I will sign it. And then board directors, if they would like to, can sign in their own personal capacity as a director. And so it won't be a full board resolution. Um, so I just like to read that. Declaring the first Friday in June to be National Gun Violence Awareness Day. This proclamation declares the first Friday in June to be National Gun Violence Awareness Day in the Seattle School District to honor and remember all victims and survivors of gun violence and to declare that we as a country must do more to reduce gun violence. Whereas the protecting, whereas Washington State has 753 gun deaths every year with a rate of 10 deaths per 100,000 people. Washington has the 39th highest rate of gun deaths in the U.S. And whereas 
protecting public safety and the communities they serve is the district's highest responsibility. And whereas in January 2013, Hidea Pendleton, a teenager who marched in the presidential inaugural parade, was tragically shot and killed just a few weeks later, should now be celebrating her 23rd birthday. And whereas to help honor Hadiya and the more than 100 Americans whose lives are cut short every day and the countless survivors who are injured by shootings every day, a national coalition of organizations has designated June 5th, 2020, the first Friday in June as the sixth National Gun Violence Awareness Day. And whereas we renew our commitment to reduce gun violence and pledge to do all we can to keep firearms out of the wrong hands and encourage responsible gun ownership to keep our children safe. Now it is therefore proclaimed that Seattle Public Schools declares the first Friday in June, June 5th, 2020, to be National Gun Violence Awareness Day and encourages all schools to support their local community's efforts to prevent the tragic effects of gun violence and to honor and value human lives. And so, um, that will be a proclamation that's created. I will sign on. And then, uh, of course, uh, all the board directors are uh, free to sign on as well in their own director capacity, not as a board. And so what I wanted to make sure that we cover today is uh, the Let's Talk tool. I know we've had previous conversations about it. Um, and building trust with our Seattle Public School community has been a goal of mine since arriving here. And to build trust, we must be responsive to our community and provide accurate and timely information. And as you all know, last spring, we piloted a, sort of a software that's called Let's Talk. It's an online customer and engagement tool that's in support of this goal. Um, this tool helps us streamline customer service and communication while making sure families, students, and staff get the information they need. We've now expanded Let's Talk to multiple departments. Um, it's been really successful. We've received a lot of positive feedback, both from staff and from our broader SPF community. And so um, I've asked Heidi Henderson Lewis, the customer service manager and ombudswoman, to share how Let's Talk works. She's been really project managing this and um, working this through and has just been a phenomenal leader on this effort. And so I've asked her to highlight how the use of the tool has improved customer service during the pilot and the benefits of expanding Let's Talk to the board office. Um, we know that you guys, we all get a lot of email coming into the school board at seattleschools.org. And this is really a phenomenal time after you learn about it, maybe to have conversations about whether you would like to include that email address in the Let's Talk um, platform so that we can um, get everything answered in a timely way with accurate information. Um, so one caveat that I will make because of the packed agenda and because we want to make sure we're clear on all the questions, we won't really have time for questions today. So I do want to gather those questions though. And so please send those questions directly to Heidi after this short presentation. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Heidi. Thank you, Heidi, for being here with us today. Heidi on. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Oh. I just did my whole speech and now I'm <laughs> so thank you, Superintendent Juno. I was saying that um, because this is let's talk is maybe new to a lot of people who are on the call that I have prepared a short 60 second video just to do an overview of what let's talk is and then I'll chat for a few minutes touching on what um, some of the benefits are. And I believe Nellie's working on uploading that for us. There. Hello. Oh.
Introducing Let's Talk, the cloud-based community engagement and customer experience solution that helps school leaders build trusted relationships with their communities. Let's Talk can be accessed through any device, anywhere, at any time. Community members submit their feedback, including questions, suggestions, and concerns through your school district website or via mobile app. Each submission or dialogue flows into a universal inbox where important or sensitive messages are marked as critical. The system immediately routes each message to the right team or person for a timely response. A back-end dashboard helps you track and measure response times and shows you what issues are trending. Parents, students, and teachers are asked to rate the quality of each interaction. School leaders use that information to keep improving. Let's Talk is a simple way to streamline communication and build and nurture community trust. Try it today. Great. Thank you, Ellie. So, so that's a quick overview of what Let's Talk is for those who haven't had a chance to understand what it is. And while... Um, we're transitioning here that video we're going to I'm going to chat a little bit about the benefits of it. I would say as someone who has been working with schools, families and communities for all of my career from a position from a school staff as a parent, as a community partner, as a central office staff, it feels good to have a predictable and consistent operational system where we have been able to create like a centralized hub for questions, concerns, inquiries, even compliments with the ability to collaborate internally for a more seamless customer experience. Now that was a, a lot, but it, it is a big deal to have a system like this that can allow us to be smarter, work faster, and it's just robust in many ways and allows us to provide a more efficient service to anyone who's reaching out to our district using this tool. So you had mentioned, um, Superintendent, for us to, for me to mention maybe some of the benefits and how this can support the board office. Anyone who uses it, I think it'll support their their work. As um, I'm chatting here, I'm going to pull up my screen so we have a view of what um, one way that you can access Let's Talk here on our website. If everyone can see this, we have this little tab that pops out. This is one way to access Let's Talk, and because. Um, now that we have this robust data-driven dashboard with all the internal capabilities, including collaboration capacity, we are able to provide the students and families and employees and even the general public a more faster response time um, from the most qualified department. So let's say someone is not sure what to do. They can click on that tab. They can you know, select one of these topics here or just a other question. They can also go to some of our, these are like our top departments right now that get a lot of flow. So we put them here for easy access. They can click on one of those departments and send their information. And if they get the wrong department, it's okay because we have this internal dashboard as the video showed where we can reassign it to the best department for the most, um, for the fastest response. So if we like, for an example, I just click other questions. You can select I'm a student or employee. All this information comes into our system uh, and then it, it's really nice because as described in the video, we can add buttons based on trends. So if we notice we're getting a lot of questions on a particular topic, we can add that topic button here. Uh, we can also add another department. So that way it's just, we, we can cut out the middleman. If everything's coming in through a general question, then we have to get it to someone else that slows down response time. So because of some of the mechanisms that the system allows us to provide, we can get faster response times, which is one of the number one, uh, one of the number one um, areas that needs improvement where families and community and everyone, like people aren't responding fast enough. It also provides us an opportunity to score a customer. So when this is all done and the, the issue or the question is answered, the and the person who reached out could is sent a survey and they're allowed to score us a one through 10 and give feedback, type in what worked well and what didn't work well for them. And we have been able to actually follow up with people who say like, oh, I, you know, they didn't answer my question at all or something, you know, wasn't right. We were able to follow back up and say, well, you know, we're really sorry about that. Let's get it right, which is a great benefit and is a game changer, quite frankly, as it relates to quality assurance. There's not a really a way to ensure that people, when they reach out to us electronically, that they had a successful engagement with us. And this allows us to do that. Another really nice benefit of 
this tool is that with Outlook, you really, it's only for the English language. Like if someone sends us something in another language, there's no, there's no way to respond immediately. This tool actually has a language option. So, you know, pa parents can select a language, our top languages are there and they can communicate in their language. And when they do that, it will come to us in English and then we can type and it translates um, using Thank you to being it's not perfect but it's great uh, and we've been able to communicate with parents in their language and so that's been a nice feature to our um to our communicating through electronics so whether it's the board office or the ombuds office or or the customer service or any department in the middle of the night as a parent i know sometimes in the middle of the night i want to send a message i want to reach out i want to say something and maybe in the morning have a response or in the afternoon and and when you don't speak english it's hard to do that but with this tool they can actually do that so that's one of my favorite features another one of my favorite features um, is that you can actually text to the system so parents who don't do email or public people who don't do email they can actually send a text that comes into our system and we're able to get it to the right department for for proper follow-up uh, so I, I love that. So those are a few of the the couple of the benefits I think are really nice um, adds to this um, Outlook engagement. And let's see, what are, let's see, one other thing I wanted to show you guys here is, real quick, we also have this great um, ability to pull data. So like, for example, I pulled our data from April 2019 through May 25th. And we have 7,825 dialogues. And mind you, we didn't, this is a soft launch, just putting it on our website for a few, you know, one department. And we're able to pull this. Like right now, our average response time is 1.5. That's the national average response time is 3.8. We have an average customer experience of 8.0. The national average is 8.6. And, you know, I quite frankly, I've been looking at the data. I think it would be a lot higher. There's a lot of user error where people are getting used to it. Um, we're able to pull things that people are saying about the system and then look at the frequently visit departments. So we have this entail where we can make sure we're, you know, making sure the departments are staffed up and ready to respond. Um, yeah. And then so here I put a little note at the end of March, 2020 SPS began utilizing the let's talk feature uh, of turning on the phone calls and text into dialogues, which has been a great hit for a lot of our parents. They're really excited about that feature. So anyways, that's it. I will, because I know there's lots to talk about. And so those are some of the benefits I think of the board office was to utilize um, the system and they can, you know, get it to the right person. If something comes in, it's not for the board office, they can change it and send it to another department easily within the system and know that that person is going to get a response. And if there are any, if there's anything that from today that you have questions about, something you want me to drill down more on, because this is just a super quick overview. You can't even do the system justice in this little bit of time, but I wanted to put this out there. Please feel free to send me an email, uh, reach out to me and teams if you're a staff person. And I'm happy to attend an executive committee meeting in the future to discuss this further. Yeah, President DeWolf, I would offer um, any questions um, to go to Heidi in email form, and then maybe we'll collect those and present at an executive committee meeting um, to talk further about um, potential use of this tool for the school board email. You can see that there's a lot of great data that comes out of it and really good information and it allows us to um, continually review um, information um, with ourselves so that we can get better and understand how we can communicate better with our community, families, students, and parents. And so it's a great tool. Uh, I know Heidi's been a great leader on this. I am totally bought into it and would just like to have further conversation with the executive committee about it. Thank you. Okay. We have now reached the consent portion of today's agenda. May I have a motion for the consent agenda? I move approval of the consent agenda. This is Director Hampson. Second, Director Harris. Thank you, directors. Approval of the consent agenda has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. Do directors have any items they would like to remove from the consent agenda? Hi, this is Director Rivera Smith. Um, I would like to remove the minutes from the public affairs and budget work session from the consent agenda. I don't, I don't see that. Um, 
at least am I missing that on my those would be the April 22nd um, work session thank minutes. you sorry yes sorry about that yeah no 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 that's good thank you director uh, Rivera Smith okay so may I have a, re a revised motion for the consent agenda as amended I move approval of the consent agenda as amended. This is Director Hampson. Second. Thank you, Director. <laughs> approval of the consent agenda as amended has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. All those uh, in favor of the consent agenda as amended, please signify now by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, here, uh, this, the consent agenda has passed unanimously. So uh, we will uh, see, we'll look at uh, the April 22nd, 2020 work session. Um, is there a motion to approve this item? This is Director Hampson. I move for the approval of the meeting minutes from the April 22nd, 2020 work session. Thank you. And can we specify in the minute that it's public affairs work session budget as well, please? And yes, then second. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. All right. So this motion has been uh, moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. I'll now call on directors uh, on the director who removed the item, and then I'll do uh, go through the uh, directors alphabetically for uh, comments and questions. So uh, for this item, we'll start with Director Rivera-Smith. Thank you. I just wanted to quickly, um, so in going through the minutes for this work session, both the public affairs side and the budget, I just found a number of um, typos, uh, missing words, things like that. And after three or four, I decided maybe just it would be better to pull it all together. I can talk offline with um, the, whoever wrote, produced these minutes uh, just to get them cleaned up. Um, it's, it's not, they're nothing huge. I think um, completely substantial, except that, you know, our minutes are our record. And I really think that um, it would be good to correct some of the um, typos, errors, um, admissions in them. Thank Relations. you, Director Rivera-Smith. Uh, Chief Counsel Narva, can you clarify um, the process around this just to um, make sure I'm not missing anything as far as um, being able to adjust some grammar and typos and how that fits in here? Right. This, this is, we did something similar recently with the minutes from the retreat. Uh, they had been on the board agenda and then were moved to a later board meeting to make some make some changes. So the motion that would be offered here would be to defer consideration of these minutes to the next regular board meeting. And then that would give an opportunity for Dir Director Rivera-Smith to work with staff on changes that she thinks are necessary. So that, that motion could be brought by Director Rivera-Smith. And then if there were a second, that could be uh, uh, put to the board. <clears throat> so Greg, can you clarify the process um, for that? Um, for that, <clears throat> we just we just basically we just made a motion, but it sounds like there might be a. Uh, Lisa needs to make a separate motion. Yes, yes. You, you would recognize her to bring a motion to defer uh, consideration of the minutes from the April twenty second work sessions to the next regular board meeting, uh, okay. and then if there were a second, that motion would be voted on. If it passed, then we would remove that item would be removed from the agenda today. Presumably, the minutes would be worked on, and then they'd come up for consideration at the board meeting two weeks from now. Okay. All right, I'm ready to do that. I will make a motion to defer the the, the minutes from the April um, 22nd work session to be taken back and um, corrected the um, errors and um, edits from that, and bring it back to the next board meeting for approval. Thanks, Director second, Do I have a second? Second, I'm sorry, Director, Director Harris, yep. public affairs and work session budget. Thank you. Underst understood. Thanks, Director Harris. This has been moved and second moved direct moved by Director Rivera Smith and seconded by Director Harris. So Greg, now we just take roll call for this uh, item, correct? Correct. That's correct. Oh, okay. So Ms. Wilson Jones, can you do roll call for us? Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris? Aye. Director Hosey? Aye. 
Director Mack? Aye. Director Rankin? Aye. Director Rivera-Smith? Aye. Director DeWolf? Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. Okay, we will now move to uh, to the action item on today's agenda, uh, as I stated before, we have three uh, items on our action uh, on our action. Excuse me, on our action item agenda, and I think I saw the number 18 on our introduction items. So as we move through these items and later the introduction items, I will first call on the committee chairs, and then I'll call on the remaining order uh, directors alphabetically for questions and comments. So now we will move to action item number one. High School Chemistry B, Instructional Materials Adoption. May I have a motion for this item? This is Director Hampson. I move that the Seattle School Board approve the recommendation of the Instructional Materials Committee to adopt the district developed Chem B High School Instructional Materials as recommended by the High School Science Instructional Materials Adoption Committee. These materials were developed by Seattle Public Schools chemistry teachers in collaboration with university partners. The materials will be used as core instruction materials for Seattle Public Schools High School Chemistry B, Chem B, Science classrooms. I further move that the Seattle School Board authorize the superintendent to enter into agreements and incur costs as detailed in Section 5, Fiscal Impact Revenue Source, to implement the Chem B instructional materials for all Seattle Public Schools High School Chemistry B, Chem B, Science classrooms for an amount not to exceed $367,845 covering school years 2020 to 21 through 2027 to 28. Second the motion. Thank you. Thank you, directors. This item, Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris, will now move to directors for any comments or questions for Chief Academic Officer Dr. Diane DeBacker before we vote. So I will now start with Director Rankin, who is our uh, current uh, Curriculum and Instruction Policy Committee Chair. Thank you. Um, I do not have any questions or comments. We've, um, I feel like, seen this item quite a few times <laughs> since it was introduced in committee, and um, I'm excited to move it forward. Thank you, Director Rankin. Okay, now we'll move to Director Hampson. No questions for me, thank you. Thank you, Director Hampson. Director Harris. Deep breath first. Um, as many of you all can recollect, the uh, adoption of our new science curriculum was very painful a year ago. And the vote that I took to approve it was very painful. And I think that I've heard more about that than any other single item from frustrated parents and teachers. And I go back to my initial question the first time this was brought up um, by central office staff and an impressive group of science teachers that had been working very hard for a couple of years prior to the board being even advised that this was on the agenda. Um, I do not understand why we need to grow our own when other school districts around the country are using curriculum that uh, we did not have to put together ourselves and which um, may be vetted more thoroughly. I will be voting no on this agenda item. Thank you. Okay, next we'll have Director Percy. No questions from me. Thank you, Director Mack. Uh, good afternoon, Director Mack here. I have no questions or comments at this time, um, but I plan to abstain on this vote. All right. Next one, Director Rankin. Excuse me, Director Vera Smith. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't ready. Um, 
sorry. Um, no, I, I hear, I hear Director Harris's concerns. Um, I also, you know, I also really value that our instructors came together to create this, um, and I, I appreciate their work they put into it. Um, you know, I, I think that the most you can tailor something to your own, to your own classrooms, the better. Um, not to say that the, the more national um, curriculums can't do that too, but anyhow, um, I. I just want to give that comment, but um, I have no other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Director Vera Smith. And I, and I also have no questions at this time. I know we've got to talk about this issue uh, over the last couple of months. I will now turn it over to Ms. Wilson Jones for the vote. Director Mack? Abstain. Director Rankin? Aye. Director Rivera-Smith? Aye. Director Hampson? Aye. Director Harris? Nay. Director Hersey? Aye. Director DeWolf? Aye. This motion has passed with a vote of five to one to one. Thank you. Okay, then we will now move on to action item number two, approval of the successor collective bargaining agreement between Seattle Public Schools, also known as the district, and the Seattle King County Building and Construction Trades Council, also known as the council, for September 1, 2019 through August 31st, 2022. This came through the executive committee on May 20th for approval. So may I have a motion for this item? This is Director Hampson. I move that the school board approve the CBA and authorize the superintendent to execute the agreement with the council with the wage schedules and other attachments in the form of the draft CBA for the period September 1st, 2019 through August 31st, 2022 as attached to the school board action report with any minor additions, deletions and modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent and to take any necessary actions to implement the CBA. Immediate action is in the best interest of the district. Second the motion. Thank you, directors. This item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. This agenda, excuse me, this item is on the agenda for introduction and action today. So uh, I'd like to invite Chief Human Resources Off Officer, Dr. Clover Codd. Uh, I believe you will be briefing us. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. This is Clover Codd. Um, I'm also joined by uh, Chief Jolyn Berge for financial questions and Director of Labor Relations, Tom Polis, if there are questions at the uh, end of this short presentation. So this bar is for the approval of a new CBA uh, between Seattle Public Schools and the Seattle King County Trades Council, which would expire on August 31st. Um, the past one did expire on August 31st, 2019. So the Trades Council represents a variety of crafts and trades uh, employed by the district. They maintain our electrical, plumbing, fire alarm, locks, electronic systems throughout the district, as well as many other critical maintenance functions. I'd like to give a little shout out to our crafts and trades for the work that they do in our district um, and thank them for their dedication. This new CBA, if approved, will have a term uh, beginning September 1, 2019 through August 31st, 2022. The parties have been negotiating um, since late August of 2019, met nine separate times, um, including a variety of phone meetings, and reached a tentative agreement on April 16th, 2020. The union membership ratified the tentative agreement on April 29th, 2020. And the wage increases in this tentative agreement um, are as follows. Across the board, wage increases of 5.4% in 1920, retroactive to September 1st, 2019, uh, September 1st, excuse me. Electricians will receive a $2.50 per hour increase in their base wage prior to that 5.4% increase to address significant recruitment and retention concerns. Across the board, wage increases of 2.1% in 2021, or the state-funded and authorized inflationary increase, whichever is higher. And then across the board, wage increases of 2.0% in 21-22, or the state-funded and authorized inflationary increase, whichever is higher. 
The methodology that the district has been using when we approach wage increases in our recent bargains has been to identify nearby school districts or comparables. Um, and we try to ensure that each of our job classifications ranks um, at fourth or fifth place out of approximately 10 uh, comparable districts and not dropping below that fifth place. The wage increases herein do um, meet that methodology um, and the $2.50 per hour bump for the electricians was necessary because when we started, they were 10th out of 10 in comparables prior to this new CBA. Um, other economic changes, uh, a 50 cent increase in the swing shift differential, increases in the bonus provided to employees who don't take leave during peak work times in the summer, a new $50 per day on-call bonus for general foreman, a new $150 per hour premium for temporary employees whose insurance we can no longer fund under the new SEB um, uh, insurance uh, paradigm. And the non-economic changes outlined here, uh, we're moving all employees to receiving electronic pay step statements, uh, language changes to comply with the Janus Supreme Court decision regarding union dues, uh, language to reflect the new SEB insurance uh, program and updates to Washington state law regarding sick leave, and a requirement that when negotiating future wage increases, the parties will review comparable school districts during negotiations. And with that overview, I will open it up for questions. Thank you, Dr. Clevercod. Uh, now to direct, now I'll move to directors for any comments or questions before we move to the vote. And I uh, will start with myself as the executive committee chair. Um, but uh, mostly, if, I, if anything, I just want to share thank you um, to Dr. Clevercod and your team um, for bringing this forward and putting this together. I know this was a lot of hard work, and I'm, I, I know our labor partners have been um, really working on this. Uh, so I'm grateful that you're bringing this before the board and I have no questions at this time. So now we'll move to Director Hampson. Uh, thank you for this work. Uh, and I am grateful to have the opportunity to provide some, uh, I, I believe if I recall from our, our meeting and executive session that this gets this particular uh, trades class for Seattle Public Schools. I, I correct me if I'm wrong, um, Chief Berge, to fifth um, in terms of district pay for this particular um, job class. And I think it's absolutely critical that we're able to maintain um, equitable pay opportunities for our um, all of our employees um, and union members uh, with uh, median income in um, the city of Seattle. Uh, over 110,000 for a family of four. Um, we're at a point where uh, folks qualify for, for um, low income housing at, um, at $95,000. And um, it's absolutely imperative that we're able to remain competitive as a district if in fact we wanna accomplish our goals and, and allow our staff to live where they work. Um, and uh, make it possi possible for them to um, to have a fair living wage um, in this in this very um, costly um, area. So I appreciate the work, and I hope that this does um, get us part way to where we need to be. Um, I think we should be number one in terms of our, of our pay, but um, I, I know that there's been a lot of hard work trying to get us there, and I, I appreciate the work on on both sides to um, make that happen. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you. Director Hampson. Next, we'll move on to Director Harris. Uh, no questions, and thank you, Tom, and your team for negotiating this. And to echo um, Director Hampson's comments, finding skilled trades workers in the midst of the construction boom, at least pre-COVID, is is a neat trick. And I think that um, Chief Podesta and the operations folks can can speak to that and I'm, I'm glad that we're uh, upping our game and we were convinced by Chief Berge that we can expect to afford this raise and that it is in line with other raises. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Next we'll have Director Hersey. 
no questions for me at this time, but just a huge thank you for the huge lift that this was. And I am just excited that we are working toward um, economic enfranchisement for our labor partners. So big, big, big thank you for this and hope to see more agreements like it in the future. Thank you, Director Ursi. Next, we'll have Director Mack. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I am uh, very much in support of the uh, agreement as it's been verbally expressed. Um, at the same time there, the documents that are attached to the board action report um, have a number of um, inconsistencies in terms of referring to um, things that aren't where they say they're going to be on which page and including the MOU is actually not attached. Um, so my question is about whether or not those um, kind of technical aspects to the documentation that need to be uh, cleaned up and corrected, um, including the MOU, which isn't isn't present in the documents that are posted. Um, how can we go about having the actual documents that we are approving today uh, be correct and accurate? Chief Counsel Narver, can you help us here? Um, I'm I'm sorry. The the in terms of correcting uh, inaccuracies in the documents. Just I think what Director Max is asking about is given that there's been uh, elevation that there are some problems for example it says this content is on this page in the contents table yeah. of contents but it's actually on a different <laughs> page can you share with us the process for both correcting that and then i think there was another question with, with director mac but i think that was at least the first one i heard right so i think that there's a just to, to clarify the um there's a number of um kind of editorial references that are um mistakes, typos, I'm not sure. Uh, but the, the primary concern is that the MOU, which should be attached, is not included. Okay. Um, so there's a, a large portion of the document that's not there, as well as a number of other um, issues with the materials that are presented. Okay, so, so in terms of- If you'd like, this is uh, Director of Labor Relations, Tom Polis. Um, so uh, the MOU on electronic pay statements, the tentative agreement was to have that MOU outside of the collective bargaining agreement um, in case we needed to modify it after moving to electronic pay statements slightly. Um, so that is why it's not part of the CBA. And as for the other reference errors, the motion um, that the board is considering does give the superintendent the authority to make minor additions, deletions, and modifications. Um, and we also have an agreement from the Trades Council to work on those reference issues um, if this is approved. Yeah, I, I'll uh, add Director, to that. Oh, sorry. sorry. I was going to just no, add. I was that. just going to say, Director DeWall. Oh. Chief Council Narver, go ahead. Okay. I was going to just say that uh, consistent with what Tom just said about the authorization and the motion for those kinds of changes. It is not at all unusual with a particularly a lengthy document that that's gone through a lot of edits and changes that there will be uh, references to section nine that later got renumbered to section eight or table of contents that don't measure up. And so that it doesn't have to keep coming back before the board as those minor changes are discovered. That's why that, that language is in the motion and, uh, as Tom said, there's been contact already with the uh, Trade Council and an agreement that that'll all get all, all get cleaned up. So any issues along those lines can easily be resolved uh, and doesn't doesn't stand in the way of board approval of the CBA today. Uh, Director DeWolf, just for clarification uh, uh, on the question of the MOU um, and it being outside of this. Um, CBA agreement, um, the just I, I I just like verbal clarification on which things will be corrected in the documents so that we're clear on what we're approving um, and the clarification around the MOU not being a part of the uh, CBA um, just 
I would just like to uh, I appreciate what uh, Mr. Narber has stated, uh, but I think for the record, we need clarification on, on um, what things will be corrected. And the MOU is kind of a big one to have that stated that it won't be a part of this. So if we can verbally have whatever clarification um, to that, uh, I would be much appreciative. The staff. So, so this is um, uh, Chief Clover Cod. Um, the the MOU is drafted, but um, it's not a hundred percent final. So the um, we may need to make minor edits as we look at um, sort of the first month of implementation. The MOU would not change um, in substance, and it would not have an economic impact on the collective bargaining agreement. We often have MOUs with labor partners that do not come before the board if they do not change um, substantive language in the collective bargaining agreement itself. And so the trades ask that we not include this language in the actual CBA, but that the language be done in an MOU. Director DeWolf, this is Director Hampson. Director Hampson. Uh, I just want to restate, um, as I think it's very clearly covered in the motion, that um, the, the, my, my motion was that um, with any minor additions, deletions, and modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent and to take any necessary actions to implement the CBA, and I believe the MOU um, has implemented, particularly with respect to electron electronic payments, and as we have um, seen with MOUs before, falls falls under that and is all well within the guidelines of what we're approving. Okay. Point Thank of you. clarification, please. Director Harris. Thank you. And this is, I believe, a question to Chief Cod. Uh, is there some place on the website that has a listing of all the MOUs? This keeps coming up Direc that we've got Director these Harris. other MOUs. Yes, sir. I was just going to say, can I actually just make sure Director Mack doesn't have any more questions, and then I will hold to let you ask your um, questions. Would that be okay? That's fine. Thank you, sir. Okay. Director Mack, any other? Uh, just the clarification, as I understand it, is that the MOU is not uh, finalized and not part of the CBA, and it will be negotiated separately, and that the motion we're passing is uh, the general content of the CBA as it is. Um, if That's my understanding of, um, and is that an accurate assessment, uh, Mr. Narber? I, I believe so. I, I'm not the right person to speak to the MOU. I think Clover addressed that. But in terms of, uh, I think we, you, you said you wanted for the record a clarification of what was going to be corrected. I, I, I read that motion more as saying, look, things are going to be discovered in a long document. And I don't know that there's necessarily an exhaustive list ready of corrections to the table of contents, for example. Uh, or, or references that don't exactly match up, but that as long as we're talking about things that are on that level, uh, the authorization has been made to the superintendent to make those technical corrections. So I, 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 I don't think it's part of the task today to catalog what those what those corrections are going to be, as long as they're at that level of uh, minor modifications, additions. Thanks, Chief. Uh, okay, Any other, uh, Director Max? So, yeah. So actually, that's where the clarification is needed. The document states that the MOU is part of the CBA, but as I'm understanding um, the uh, staff, it is not expected to be part of the CBA. Um, so that's not a minor clarification. Can you uh, share where you're seeing that, Director Mack? Uh, well, let's see if you're wrong. I'm not seeing in the motion. Uh, uh, not in the motion, it's actually in the documentation, and it Got states. It. No, no, I understand. Um, Director DeWolf and Director Mack, maybe I can help answer that. This is Clover. So it is um, very common for MOUs to be attached as addendums at the, in, the, in the appendices of a CBA. If you were to go on our website and look at the Seattle Education Association CBA, you would see that there are um, over 30 MOUs attached and uploaded on the internet. And so they're outside the CBA, but they are sort of appendices in the CBA. So it, it would be essentially an attachment. 
Thank you. Director Mack, uh, I'd like to uh, move to Director Harris. So I think she had a question that is very relevant to this. Yeah, that's no problem. I'll come back to me if I don't um, get it answered. Thank you. Thank you. Director Harris. Uh, and I think I may have half an answer from Chief Cod just a moment ago. Is there a place where all of the memorandums of understanding are uploaded with respect to our CBA? I can't count the number of times that we've referred to that and our jaws drop because we're unaware of it. So the MOUs that are associated with any given collective bargaining agreement, and I just gave the example, Seattle Education Association, they are all attached. If you go on our website, all of the CBAs are attached and the MOUs that are applicable and still within the timeline of that CBA should also be attached as appendices. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Director Rankin. Hi, sorry. Um, I do not have any questions. I'm just going to echo some of the earlier comments of appreciation uh, for bringing, um, especially for electricians, because I know that can be um, a, a challenge to hire because our pay hasn't been as competitive. Um, so just appreciating um, that uh, we are working towards that as the largest school district in the state. Um, you know, we want to have the the best workforce that we can, and and also offer the best that we can to to those um, workers. So uh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. Director Rivera Smith. Thanks. Um. Yeah. I I had the same concerns that Director Mac has has already outlined. I'm hearing somebody else. Sorry. <laughs> um. Um. So I I guess last. Point. I, and I really appreciate if this. Folks could mute your phones, please. Uh, uh, Director Rivera Smith is speaking. There's, a, there's somebody still. Thank you. I think they got All it. Right. Thank, Smith. Yep. thank you. No. And I appreciate uh, there is that part of this um, motion that is to with any modifications um, and all that, all that part. So, my question there is then so, since there are clearly a number of um, inaccuracies on the table of contents and referring to items that don't exist um, in the documents, um, certain you know um sections that aren't actually even there anymore those are going to get modified i trust that is this then brought back to us so that we can see that that all happened and that those corrections and whatever as modifications and adjustments are made is that ever brought back that's my question not for a vote but just for you know informational kind of sharing Director Rosera Smith, this is Clover Cloud. Um, when we have a complete and final 100% corrected actual collective bargaining agreement that's been agreed upon, we can send you a link. Um, it will be posted on our website and we can send you a link to that so that everyone can see the final product. Okay, like in a Friday memo or someplace like that? I mean, sure. Yes. Thank you. Yes. All right, no, no further questions. Thank you. All right, uh, let's move to roll call, Ms. Wilson-Jones. Um, uh, Director, Director um, DeWolf, the, the question that you asked me was, where is the, where is my concern? And the concern is still, when I look at the documents, the actual CBA lists as part of the CBA on the title page, as well as the table of contents, that the MOU is included. Director Mack, I think it has been well stated that there will be modifications, and I, I don't think we can get any more answers on this, so I, I just would like to move on to a vote, because I think they've answered this question a few times. Okay, well, because the documents are not actually final and we're not voting on a final product, I cannot vote yes, even though I agree with the intent That's here. That's absolutely right. Okay. Ms. Wilson-Jones, roll call, please. Director Rankin. Hi. Director Rivera Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Director Hersey. Aye. Director Mack. Oh, sorry. Yes, Director Mack. No. 
Director DeWolf. Aye. This motion has passed with a vote of six to one. Thank you, directors. We will now move to action item number three. It is 1.55 p.m. This is action item number three, approval of board resolution number 2019-20-36 to affirm the district's continuous learning plan and support the district's application to the State Department of Education to waive lost instructional hours due to the novel coronavirus, otherwise known as COVID-19 pandemic. This came through CNI on May 19th for consideration. May I have a motion for this item, please? This is Director Hampson. I move the school board approve board resolution number 2019-20-36 as attached to the board action report, affirm the district's attached continuous learning plan and approved the district to apply to request a waiver of instructional hours from the State Department of Education Immediate action is in the best interest of the district. Uh, if I can actually just restate that um, to be consistent with the bar, uh, to uh, apply to request a waiver of instructional hours and days from the State Department of Education, immediate action is in the best interest of the district. Thank you. Second, second the motion. Thank you, Director Harris. All right, this item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. This item is on the agenda for introduction and action today. Chief of Schools and Continuous Improvement, Wyatt Jesse, I believe you will be briefing us today. Yes, I will. Good afternoon, uh, Wyatt Jesse, Chief of Schools and Continuous Improvement. Uh, moving this forward to you due to the recent uh, actions under COVID-19, uh, the state has uh, updated its own uh, WAC in regards to emergency waiver request regarding school days and instructional hours. And so under that uh, particular request, districts are supposed to provide a, um, uh, a board resolution, uh, which is attached to this particular bar, as well as a continuous learning plan, uh, which has a number of uh, attachments that we have already sent to staff that support the continuous learning plan where we are stating the type of services we are, the the amount of time we are that supports student engagement as well as calendaring and grading. Those are the particular areas that are contained in the continuous learning plan that is attached to this bar. Um, and again, these are the things that we have put out uh, to staff, uh, both teachers, uh, support staff, as well as principals to make sure that they're clear about not only uh, the learning expectations uh, for our students, but also staff expectations uh, for daily and weekly uh, engagement and instruction for our students, as well as our, our families. Um, we are more reliant on our families as we are partnering uh, in this actions. The reason we have uh, to amend the amount of hours that we're providing, we're, we're usually supposed to provide an average of 1,027 hours and 180 school days but because of the closure uh, mid-March and with the directive by the governor as well as OSPI to have a remote learning uh, starting on March 30th and then the closure by the governor on April 6th that we would not be reopening schools this school year. So we are uh, submitting our plan and so that's what I have in front of you is uh, not only the board resolution again as well as our continuous learning plan that we've uh, already been implementing and will implement as we close out this school year on June 19th. If we do not pass this, we will be forfeiting our $243 million uh, on, out, on our annual allocation for basic education uh, apportionment. Okay, thank you, Chief Jesse. Now I will move to directors for any comments or questions before we move to the vote. Again, I will start with our uh, committee chair for curriculum and instruction policy committee, and that is Director Rinkin. Uh, thank you, President DeWolf. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, we heard this in okay. our last, what? Can I just ask a quick question? Um, can you just share some of the high level stuff that um, you also talked about in committee, just so we get a sense of some of the discussion from your committee? Yes. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, so we heard this, her, her uh, talk, discussed this item in committee, um, knowing that it was coming today for introduction and action. And um, something that I want to reiterate that we talked about in committee is that this is not a um, what should we do, what could we do, you know, looking far into the future document. This is a right now document about what ha what we have been doing and what the what the learning plan has been. Um, and uh, I also want to, I guess, note that uh, the continuous learning plan <laughs> um, is the the plan, and that I know that people's experiences have not necessarily been um, directly <laughs> reflective. What? Oh, I thought I heard something. Sorry. Um, that uh, um, uh, you know, I've had ongoing discussions with uh, Chief Jesse and other staff about um, the need for consistency and uh, reliability across the district. And there's a lot of different factors and reasons why people might not be experiencing everything the same way. Um, but so, just for for clarity and, and transparency, I guess. Um, that what's in the document is uh, things that we've that we as a board have seen already because they were things that were kind of happening in real time as we responded to this crisis and what teaching and learning could look like right now or or, or yeah did look like right now. So a lot of the documents and the outlining of various um, uh, goals and, and items that uh, and expectations uh, are things that we as board directors had the opportunity to read as they were being pushed out and um, that they just include things about there's there's you know uh, grade level standards uh, expectations um, for for families expectations of educators um, expectations of uh, you know directives towards building leaders and all of these things that um, come from central office as uh, the the set of expectations. And um, between the times that those documents are created and as they go out to buildings, sometimes things go, um, <laughs> I don't know, take a left turn. And um, you know, I'm very aware that the experience and the the goals laid out in these documents are not what every child at every school and every building, um, every classroom uh, experienced. And so I I don't want to I don't want to dis I don't want to um, I guess I don't want to not call attention to that because someone could look at this and say, well, that's not what happened for us. So just to, just to clarify, this is in response to a mandate from the state to ask us what the plan had been, and this this the documents here are pieces that were the intention and goal and the the um, what am I looking for uh, the accountability and the consistency for the school level experience is something that I am still continuing to ask about and that uh, the public and our families can expect that we are continuing to ask about um, to see if we can figure out, you know, where things, um, uh, if they did get off track, where they where they did and, and why not, this information isn't making it all the way um, into classrooms and, and being carried out. So. Uh, but it's primarily, yeah, about expectations, about um, setting some grade level clarity around number of lessons, uh, number of contacts with with students, and um, and that type of thing. Um, and it is my hope and expectation that should we need to have a similar document for the fall, depending on what learning looks like, that we will get. Um, that we will be able to work with with all of our labor partners and our building leaders and and our educators and 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 come up with a way to ensure a consistent quality experience for everybody. So um, that's probably more than enough <laughs> from me. So thank you, thank you, Director Rankin. Okay, next we'll move to Director Hampson. Hi, thank you. Uh, I do believe that this provides 
um, well, just for, for me, it's always important to look at things in context. And what this represents is just as we have had to do with our contracts with um, the city to provide services, these are effectively um, the our accountability to the state to provide education services, which, uh, as this document described, uh, experienced a radical change in a very short period of time. And um, that plane that we built while um, flying it is uh, uh, is laid out here in, in the form of a framework. And I think it does that fairly. Uh, and um, as Director Rankin said, even if uh, not implemented with um, uh, anything but, you know, uh, kind of erratic fidelity um, is, is an accurate representation. Um, and I think it'll be an important document because it is, um, uh, dis it's relatively succinct and, and, um, and yet also, I think, complete. Um, it will give us a, a, a serve as an important benchmark um, for us to look back um, at what we did well and what we didn't do well um, in planning for next year, as I'm sure staff, and I know staff is already doing, and I hope that we have the opportunity to have that discussion as a board um, looking at this and saying, okay, this was, this was the framework that we set up for this period of time, which is, you know, we've only, we've got less than four weeks left. Um, and um, how, how did that go? What did we do well? What did we um, do not so well? Um, what needs you know drastic improvement? Um, so I appreciate all the work that went into it then and um, throughout this period. And um, uh, I know that, that everybody's been working tirelessly uh, to do these things. It's a lot uh, and um, uh, definitely what we need in order to make sure that we are able to move forward um, and with our waivers and with our payments or with our, our revenues. So thank you. That's all for me. Thank you, Director Hampson. Director Harris. This reminds me of all those happy conversations about the CSIP plan and that they don't have to be correct or enforced. They just have to be turned in. Um, we would forfeit $240 million if we don't vote yes for this, yet it's not important enough to have a work session with all the board. And frankly, I find the, the uh, phrase erratic fidelity to be brilliant. <laughs> and the frustrations and concerns that we are hearing about several times daily from our families and our students about the difference in application of online learning, depending on your school and depending on your school leaders and your director. Um, I'm gonna be abstaining on this one because I don't think we're there yet. And I think it's a hugely important document, just like our CSIPs are and have been. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hersey. Uh, we discussed this pretty thoroughly, <clears throat> excuse me, in committee, um, and I'm just really excited to have this document so that we can begin thinking about how, you know, echo echoing what Director Hanson said a moment ago, how we can build upon this, knowing that we are going to be in a similar situation um, potentially as soon as four or five months from now. So I'm really excited to highlight the opportunities where we can improve. Um, family engagement is a huge one that we've been hearing about and this document will help us identify how exactly we can do that in, in actual policy, right? Actual action. So I'm excited about it. Thank you. I don't have any further questions, but I would like to echo the idea of having sometime in the future a work session around this document to see how can we use this in a way to be responsive to what our families were missing um, during school closures as a result of COVID-19. Thank you, Director Hersey. Next, we'll move to Director Mack. Hi, good afternoon again. Um, I have two uh, lines of questions. Um, in uh, specific to the WAC that was formed by OSPI uh, 
and the there's four different sections of what we have to be attesting to here um, when we're signing off on this resolution of the continuous learning plan. Um, and I'll take the second one first. I did contact staff ahead of time to let them know I was going to be asking these questions. So I hope that that was enough um, leeway to, to find where in the document um, our plan is actually responsive to what OSPI is asking for. Um, the Under the WAC number three, section A says the local education agency's plan for continuous learning must establish a district or school-based system of collecting information regarding the student engagement daily or weekly to determine if the students are responding to district or school-initiated communication and participating in continuous learning. Local education agencies are not required to collect student attendance information for the purpose of reporting. Um, so my question about the record of student engagement um, in the continuous learning plan, I didn't find narrative speaking to that uh, requirement that we're to report on that. We're supposed to have a system of collecting information and then, um, uh, so I'm not sure where that is in the document um, and what our system is. And secondly, how is that being reported to the board? So the information uh, that you're referring to is titled Student and Family Engagement. It is on from pages five through seven in the continuous learning plan that's attached to the bar. And it provides a information uh, regarding a system. The system, as you can see, just even in the WAC itself, really should start at the school level. That's where the engagement is for our educational staff to engage with our families and our students. Um, many of our students are younger, so that engagement is really critical for them to reach out. We do talk about the different uh, modes of communication via email, phone, or online. Talk about uh, different tools, the resources we, we have provided, and then oversight. And the oversight portion is where we have uh, our staff monitoring for who is on uh, the different meeting, uh, the different meetings, classroom meetings, or accessing uh, their lessons online. And then we also have uh, administrators checking in with staff. They look and review the lessons for engagement. Are they engaging themselves? They go into the online meetings to check on that. Then they work with their staff when we're uh, not receiving the levels of engagement from family from students uh, and work with the families to get students re-engaged or more further engaged, uh, working along a continuum. And then as far as central office, uh, we are reliant on our common tools. I think that's some of the deficiencies and the things that D Director Hampson is talking about is when you know, you're trying to turn around an organization where not everybody was using all the same uh, platforms. Uh, many of staff you have used or are continuing to use some of the other platforms uh, for uh, online. Uh, and so uh, we are reliant on Schoology. Usage is our primary mode of monitoring. And so we do collect that information over time. We do weekly uh, monitoring. And then uh, I have worked with the directors of schools to go out and work with inquiry with through principals. And so uh, we've seen increases in that that level, but I'm not, you know, that's the system that we've created. Uh, but I'm not a, I'm not a re in requirement of uh, obviously reporting that data per the the statute of collecting, not required to collect student uh, attendance, which is different than the term engagement. What was the other question, Director Mack? Uh, no, I, I. I I appreciate uh, the description of the system that's in place and that there is some narrative that speaks to it. I'm just not sure if from my perspective it's actually clear enough in the documentation and in what you described to be responsive to this establish a district or school-based system of collecting information because I, I I don't know how that information is being collected like the, 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 the full system is is not really clear and 
in what you said. There's a lot of kind of piecemeal things, but establishing a system is, uh, I think, a little bit more specific and comprehensive. Um, so I'm not sure how responsive it is to uh, this requirement from OSPI, but I appreciate the answer. Um, the other question that I had was around number two, the learning standards. And um, it says under the local education agencies plan for continuous learning, administrators, principals, and teachers must determine which Washington state student learning standards, skills, and knowledge are most essential for success in students' next courses, content, grade level, or post-secondary pursuit. Um, where in the document, in the plan, does it talk about the Washington State student learning standards and that uh, we've established this as it was stated here in the, in the WAC? I'm sorry, Wyeth, you might be uh, muted. Sorry. Sorry about that. So uh, that is also um, in the addendum uh, under SBS educator guidance and expectations for continu continuity of learning. And so uh, starting on page 50, it goes over and we use the term critical and power standard. That is relearning to the academic learning standards set by the state. And so those are the, that is in reference directly to learning standards for our students. And so we've highlighted those uh, elements. I, I know also uh, Chief DeBacker uh, might also have commentary regarding your question. Chief DeBacker. Mr. Jesse, can you say again what page that was on or where that was? Yeah, sure. So if you, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, just if you go, if you're scrolling, uh, sorry, the length of this document, uh, again, it's, I think it does speak to the breadth of the, of the plan. Um, uh, Diane's telling me she got dropped uh, from the call, sorry. Um, the, if you go all the way to, uh, page 50 in the document. It starts to lay out what are low state standards. We actually link those directly to OSPI. Chief Jesse, can you can you read the title of that page so folks understand? Because there's 50 of the of the yes, full I, packet and there's 50 of can. the document. Thank I, you. Yep. Uh, it is underneath addendum B1. The prologue is on uh, page 49. And then the, it starts to go into specifics regarding the content areas. It starts with literacy and language development. And it says, like the first questions we have, how can I determine critical power standards? So then it lists into what are those um, particular standards that we're working on for our students. Where can I find this scope and sequence? That's a link. Um, and then where do I get those materials? And so that also links them to the other supports uh, that we have available for them. And then, then if they had questions, and as we think about our other learners, where can you receive that information and who can you contact? Um, and so we move through, uh, those uh, documents, it goes into math and numeracy, but I just wanted to point out for you uh, regarding Director Mack's question is, what are the learning standards? And right here are spelled out just those uh, particular critical and power standards as we needed to abridge, obviously, uh, our lessons because of the less amount of instructional time we have directly with our students, uh, matching the guidance and the developmental needs of our students pre-K through 12. And this is a Diane again. I'm sorry I got dropped from the call. I'm back on and staying for any other questions, but I'm assuming that others have answered it adequately. Okay, any more questions, Director Mack, before I move on? 
Uh, no, thank you for pointing out the page number at which that one existed. I think my only comment would be that um, regarding the system of establishing the uh, district or school-based system of collecting information regarding student engagement, um, I, I still don't feel like this document is actually responsive enough, and I really uh, look forward to when we're going to get information about how we're um, doing that on, a, on the comprehensive level that that we're being requested to do so. Um, thank you. Thanks, Director Mack. Director of Air Smith. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I've been taking this all in because this is, yeah, we had a very, a very robust, <laughs> as I say, conversation in CNI about this one. And um, yeah, my notes just say CLPOMG because there was a lot there and, and um, as a few of you have, have mentioned, this is, it's a plan, um, but how it's being rolled out and who, how it's being um, actually experienced by different populations is definitely um, something that needs a lot of gap closing because we have, um, we just, you know, we've been hearing from a lot of families, a lot of people reaching out about the parts that they're not, they feel their children are not receiving. Um, and it's not just special ed who we, we hear from too. Um, we've been hearing a lot of concerns from, but even just our general populations. We did talk about this, um, Chief Jesse, about the um, the minutes. I, well, I, you and Director Mack, and I have it in my notes here um, about the minutes per um, the online minutes, and there's minimums and some given in different pages and sections. And I have here that um, you mentioned at that meeting that you would have you were happy to add minimum number of minutes for live instruction. But I don't has anything. This hasn't changed since committee, correct? There's nothing in here has been changed. Is that correct? No, we, uh, yes, we did make those changes as I, I, um, uh, informed, uh, the CNI committee. So I did make a change that changes on page 37 of the document. Um, that is in reference to, um, the, high school minutes, so we're uh, underneath the guidance of OSPI. And so I did spell out the minutes there um, as part of our conversations. I wanted to make sure that was reflected. Okay, so page 37, uh, I'm looking at it now. Um, 37, yep, and then we also, revisions to the, just the updates to page uh, 20, uh, I'm sorry, 26, uh, also for middle school, just to make sure that it's reflective of the guidance um, in relations to OSPI and what we are working with our educators on. Thank you, okay. I just said, usually the agenda says updated so you know, whatever, and I didn't see that note on there. So, so sorry, yeah, I, I was not, I was, oh, thank you for clarifying that. Um, so again, though, this, you know, the, I, I like um, Director Hersey and Director Harris have mentioned, I would really appreciate a work session. I would have appreciated a work session on this and obviously that there's still an opportunity for that going forward. This, this is, um, as also um, noted, um, that this is purely for this school year that we're finishing out right now. Um, and I really do see this this time right now as sort of, is very much a learning experience. This is this is the um, this is definitely the um, we're making our guesses and trying things that seeing what works. We're collecting the feedback, collecting the data, because um, because we haven't clearly perfected this and this um, and parents know that and the staff knows that and we were hearing you know, concerns there too about just lack of direction lack of clarity on, on things so it's everywhere and I get that we jumped in to this this was, this was thrown at us and I mean not as a district you know this was a big endeavor and but looking forward you know I really want to know that we are going to be adjusting our expectations we're going to be adjusting um, whatever plan we have for that going forward and having you know work sessions where we're all getting a chance to sit down and look at this together so that as directors we can bring in that perspective and feedback from community and from families. Um, so, you know, I, it's hard, this is interaction right now. I know we're, I know we have to do this or we're gonna lose a whole ton of funding here. Um, so uh, I appreciate all the work that's gone into it. I wanna know, I wanna feel, and I, you know, I wanna have trust that we are going to take this as a learning and take this and build upon it and use all the all like you mentioned all the information gathering we can from it and listen to the community as they're telling us 
um, where things are not happening because we can't fail our students. Um, I know that this pandemic has put us in a tight situation, but we still have that on us. And I want to know that we're doing that. So um, again, looking forward to how we can move forward with this and how we can adjust those experiences and expectations. Um, no further questions, thank you. Thank you, Director Veras, and that's great questions. Uh, I just have a couple quick questions, Chief Jesse. So the first one was, can you, um, I think Director Rankin was mentioning that this is a look back um, as opposed to the forward, correct? That is correct. That is all about the plan that we had to develop within uh, one week of the governor's directive. And so that's what a lot of those um, artifacts are. Thank you. And then I think the only other question I had was um, for Chief Berge is, uh, according to the alternatives, it says not approving a resolution would mean the district would not receive approximately $243 million in state funding. Can you clarify, the? do you have a sense of the percentage or, uh, of our budget that that number is? Hi, this is Jolynn. Um, well, I think it, I think it's basically the the apportionment, the number of days that we wouldn't get waived. So whatever those percent of the days are of the 180, 240 million dollars out of a billion dollar budget, maybe I don't know, 20 20 percent ish. Yeah. I didn't think of it in that way. I just thought I th just thought of it as we calculated how much apportionment would we get each day, and if we don't get the apportionment for those days because we don't apply for the waiver, what would we lose? Sure, I appreciate that. Um, so uh, we've had a really great discussion today, so I won't ask any more questions because it's been really great. So I will now ask Ms. Wilson-Jones for the vote. Director Rivera-Smith. Uh, Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris. Abstain. Director Hersey. Aye. Director Mack. Abstain. Director Rankin. Aye. Director DeWolf. Aye. This motion has passed with a vote of five to zero to two. Thank you. Uh, and as a reminder to folks, if you do have requests for work sessions, um, I know that discussion is forthcoming uh, around kind of the criteria for work sessions, I think an executive committee, but I, I believe you, you can talk to your committee chair about uh, a work session. So I don't want you to think that there's not possible pass forward, that there are um, ways forward, just, just work with your committee chair. We will now move to introduction items. This, uh, the time is 2.27 p.m., uh, so we'll now move to introduction item number one, which is approval of the operations data dashboard. This came through the executive committee last week on May 20th for consideration, uh, and now I'll ask senior advisor, the superintendent, Sherry Cox, to brief the board. Thank you, President uh, DeWolf, and good afternoon, directors. Um, before I get into this, I just want to first thank uh, Anna Cruz, Eric Anderson, and Aaron Bennett for um, moving this um, operations data dashboard uh, to the stages that it's in now. Um, as a reminder to directors, I just want to um, point out that we did review the operations data dashboard at the retreat in March, which I think may have been the last time we actually saw each other in person. Um, and then this came to the exec committee uh, as this bar and also a reminder that it is part of the superintendent's um, evaluation for the 1920 school year. And it's meant to be a companion to the uh, academic data um, dashboard. Uh, the two documents um, will look similar so that to the general public's viewing, um, they would not necessarily know the difference between the academic data dashboard and the operations data dashboard. And the reason is that is because we see these two um, documents um, being closely tied together. I did want to just point out that um, this, uh, the thinking that went into this by central office staff uh, centered our student voices, particularly our African-American boys, when we were thinking through 
the operational parts of our system that play the biggest impact on student outcomes. And we focused on um, thinking through the uh, operations goal in the strategic plan, the predictable and consistent. And we really honed in on the language that uh, spells out to meet, to consistently meet the high service levels that provide school leaders, students, and families the information and daily experience that allows them to experience a safe and productive learning environment. And so centering students in that language, um, we uh, uh, came out um, with the operations data dashboard that is presented here today. Um, a couple of things to just point out per our conversation in exec uh, last week, um, we did add the language around the significance of each of these me measures and why they were selected. And then um, there was a question around um, the concern around transportation based on the West Seattle Bridge being down and Chief Podesta um, can't be with us today, but he did want me to share that quote, we will need to plan for mitigation for the bridge and students will still need to get to school on time. And so he does not see that we would wanna change that goal based on the bridge being down. Um, we've also added the corrected survey dates as fall of 2021. And we've added the student satisfaction survey um, to this document as well. Um, I did want to call out that um, if we were not under our current COVID-19 closures, um, we, we would have worked on um, policy 1010 changes uh, to be in alignment with our new operations data dashboard, but due to the necessary and routine orders, um, that work will come later. And at that, Director DeWolf, I will uh, answer any questions that directors might have. Thank you, um, thank you, Sherry. Um, so now I'm gonna call on directors to ask questions and comments uh, on this item. Again, these are introduction items, so we're not voting today, but uh, and we'll obviously, uh, we'll start um, with committee chairs again. And so since this is executive committee, I will start the question. So this came through for consideration, and I think a part of it you've addressed with um, some of the clarification around student satisfaction survey and the transportation. Um, the one question I had that I think up, that came up in committee was um, just uh, an understanding how divisions will be sharing their KPIs. Good, good question. Thank you, um, President Wolf. Um, I did want to also point out that while these are just the measures that are, will be forward facing, um, each division, even those not on the operations data dashboard, will be utilizing um, KPIs similar to the ones they've used in the past and in alignment to the KPIs um, that are recommended by the uh, Great City Schools, for example. And in um, thinking through um, Superintendent Juno's uh, evaluation for 2020-21 school year, that does include include um, uh, kind of a general section. It made most sense that you would get updates on other KPIs, uh, especially pertaining um, to some of the measures uh, in her evaluation, that you would get those updates when you got uh, updates on her progress of her evaluation um, throughout the year and including on her final year end evaluation. Thank you, Sherry. Okay, now we will move to directors for questions and we'll start with Director Thompson. Hi, can you come back to me in the end? Um, I had a, took a lot of airtime during the executive session, so I'd like to give other board members time to ask questions first. Understood, thank you, Director Hampson. Uh, we will move to Director Harris, I believe. I'll pass as well for the same reasons, thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Next up is Director Hersey. No questions from me at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. Yes, I, uh, I, yes, thank you. I uh, am just today having a chance to look at this um, 
uh, I had missed that it was, it came through exec and being operations data dashboard. I'm sad that I missed that that was coming through exec and given our current uh, situation with COVID and limited meetings, et cetera, um, I can understand uh, why this came through exec and didn't come through ops. Um, but I haven't had a chance to kind of dive in deeply into the metrics and how they relate to our existing policies and various things. Um, so at this time, I don't have any specific questions. It looks uh, reasonable. Uh, it certainly looks uh, more uh, visually pleasing um, and helpful. Um, but I do need to take a little time to understand the exact metrics that are being used and how they're being um, uh, determined um, before I can provide any um, uh, meaningful feedback. And I'll, I'll do that in between now and the, um, the action time. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. And, and if you could, if you do have questions or, or, or things that come up, please uh, uh, email um, whoever appropriately, obviously Denise um, and CC me, because I'd love to make sure that by the time the um, vote comes at our next meeting that I can follow up on, on, on um, any questions or concerns you had to. Next up is Director Rankin. Hi, sorry, I was looking at the document and couldn't click over fast enough. Um, I sort of similar to Director Mack, um, I am going to take some more time between now and the next time we see this uh, to look it over. I, I, I have some questions in general about how... Folks, um, please mute your phone. You can hear a song. Sorry, that's it. No, it's me. It's it's in my house. I'm sorry. Um, okay, no worries. <laughs> um, it's uh, um, I, I just have a question about how we how we're deciding what to put on here and um and and what to share and what to track on the dashboard. So, but I will I will continue that thought offline. Okay, and I guess I'm um, direct. Director Rankin, I, I would point you to the um, third and fourth, well, actually the remaining three pages um, that do go into a little bit of an explanation about the significance of each of the measures that was chosen to be on the dashboard. And I'm happy to answer any other questions you have between now and action. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Director Rankin. Uh, and, and finally, we'll have Director Rivera-Smith. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, yeah, I, so I attended the exec committee uh, meeting where this was discussed. And so I appreciate the discussion you all had about this. Um, I appreciate that the, that there has been an addition for the student feedback, because that was one of the things that was noted at your meeting was the lack of um, representation of student input or um, feedback there. So I, I see that's there now. So that's good. I also remember that there was some talk about that some of these metrics were going to be measured via the family engagement surveys or family surveys, I guess, um, that are not happening this spring. Um, and I, I'm kind of trying to read through my notes to see where that landed. Was there going to be, I, it sounds like it was just, um, it was confirmed there was not any, there, there won't be the family surveys. So I'm looking just to know how that measurement will be represented. Uh, Director Rivera-Smith, um, there will not be family satisfaction surveys done this spring uh, because of the closures, but um, and that's why the language on the operations data dashboard changed to say fall of 2021, where we will have, um, uh, well, I, we don't know what situation we'll be in for school, but we will hope to have family satisfaction surveys going out next spring um, as we have had in similar springs. Okay, is that is, is that area there on this dashboard the only place where that information would come into play or I know there's- like Yeah, there that's, that's the only place um, it is at the bottom of the first page of the operations data dashboard itself. Those uh -huh. charts at the very bottom, those four 
or the survey results and it would give overall satisfaction. Okay, and and then I recall there was, and I'm sure Director Hampson or Director Harris will um, fill in more on this, but there was concern about how we're using, you know, these surveys to decide, you know, to re represent um, figures on this dashboard and, and some, there's still, you know, some consideration to be given that these those surveys do not ac accurately represent necessarily um, enough of our district or, or enough populations. Um, so uh, I'll leave with that there because I remember that was part of that. I'm sure they're going to talk more about that. Um, otherwise, um, I don't have any further questions or comments. Thank you. Great. And to go to that point, uh, Director Rivera Smith, um, uh, as a reminder, um, uh, Eric Anderson and his team have been working in partnership with the University of Washington as well as um, CSEC to learn um, with those organizations on how to get a better representation of our families furthest from educational justice because we know um, and are dedicated to getting the input from those families because we know they participate at a lower rate than our white families from a traditional online survey. So thank you for that. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you everybody. Next we'll move to <clears throat> Excuse me. Introduction item number two. This is the Satterberg Foundation Elementary Feeder School. Sorry, Director DeWolf. Oh, I'm so sorry, Director Hampson and Director Harris. I forgot to come back, back to you. Director That's Hampson, okay. you have some. You um, go ahead. Uh, well, I do. I want to ask um, for for those of you that didn't have time to dive into it. Uh, I hope um, that you will take that time as soon as possible and get that back to staff. Um, I think this is pretty critical. There's a lot of work that's gone into this. And uh, we, I, I don't think it's fair to let them get too far down the road without providing substantive feedback. Um, we did have a very rich discussion in our executive session. And um, I think, and I really appreciate the additions. Um, they, they give it a lot more weight. Um, and, the, and, and then the providing the, the greater context, I think is helpful. Um, it's probably still hard to look at this as a, um, outside of the organization um, and understand and we want to get to that to that point. Um, I think the thing that is still missing for me while I agree with the statements around um, the perspective impact of each of these metrics, um, I'm still not because there's it's not talked about here in a quantitative context. Uh, I'm still not feeling really um, as strongly as I as I would like to about how these metrics are in fact indicators, meaning how is it that these drivers, I mean, that these particular um, metrics are in fact drivers of student outcome. So um, what is the correlation? Like what do, what do we, how are they moving together? How are student outcomes moving together with these particular data points? And, and what are the data points? So you added the definition, you say the significance of the measure, having a high quality teacher in the classroom um, is the single most important in school factor in supporting student outcomes. How so? Like to what degree and in what way? What, what goes up and down and moves? Like what do we see that correlates with that that is consistent with our strategic plan? Um, so that's what I'm looking for. And, you know, I keep thinking that we're at some point Eric's going to be on this one of these calls and we can ask him, him some more detail. Um, but and the same thing with, you know, you can use the nutrition example, um, the, the rate of lunch participation. So for every X um, increase in lunch pr participation, uh, we can expect Y uh, increase in um, well, we're not using standardized tests now, are we? But we can expect, you know, uh, kids performing or attendance be going up or um, better. Maybe it's even better um, uh, um, attendance in the afternoon for high school students, something to that effect, um, where you're actually you're looking at data and, and showing the direct correlation. Can I can I chime in for a second? This is Director Rankin. 
Director Go ahead, Liza. Is that, is that okay? I just um I just wanted to sort of support um what Director Hansen is saying and reiterate. I feel uh, it was kind of what I was trying to get at also is like I feel like um this is a lot of of what and what I want to see and what I think Director Hansen also wants to see is the is so what is sort of the um the storytelling behind it and the connection the connection for, of these numbers to the experience and outcomes, um, you know, the data uh, is is a piece, um, but I want to know what makes us as a district feel like these points are are relevant, and why they're things that we're we're making note of and following. And if we can't answer that, then we should be looking at other measures. That's it. Thanks. That's that's enough for me as well, Director DeWolf. Thanks, Director Hampson. Director Harris. Uh, thank you. I'll echo what um, Director Rosetta Smith said about the uh, family engagement surveys, and I appreciate the, the clarification, Senior Advisor Cox, uh, very much. Um, I still have significant concern about adding on-time buses given the uh, missing West Seattle Bridge and the complete corked traffic jam now during COVID-19 on the First Avenue Bridge and South Park and Georgetown with our bus barn being south of the First Avenue Bridge. Um, we, we need to be able to do the possible, and Lord knows we understand the impossible with COVID-19, and, and certainly those of us in West Seattle and South Seattle are extraordinarily concerned about uh, our bus scenario. Thank you, Director Harris. Director DeWolf, I just wanted to add one other thing that goes actually back to your question is that um, yes. some of the data in the KPIs that teams are measuring throughout the year will come to the board in oversight work sessions as well. So the superintendent's evaluation check-ins, the final evaluation, as well as the oversight work sessions, you will see KPIs that other departments are tracking along the way. Thank you, Sharon. Question, yes. President DeWolf. Yes, yes. Can we footnote that information? We seem to lose it between conversations, drafting plans, and, and if we could footnote it, we have something to look back on about those KPIs and the other departments. Understood, yes. And, and that was, I think, partly why I asked it and brought it up from our executive committee. So, Sherry, does that make sense? Sorry, I'm just looking through here um, to see if it's in the bar anywhere and um, getting a text from Aaron saying that it's not currently in the bar. Um, but we could. Uh, oh, Aaron, <laughs> Aaron is telling me that it was too quick turnaround. So how about if we get some language in the bar that says that it'll be spelled out in um, that you'll hear in oversight work sessions as well as super superintendent evaluation check-ins in the final eval, you'll see other KPIs. It, you won't see necessarily every single KPI that the organization is measuring, but you will get a fuller view across the system. Is there a reason we wouldn't just get the full slate of API information? Um, I, I mean, I don't think we every department reports out every single KPI they're measuring. Um, I mean, we could look at how that would come to you all. I'm not. No, I'm not opposed, Director DeWolf. I just don't think that's been past practice. C certainly, right. Director Harris. Does that answer your question, or anything else we can? Well, I'd, I'd prefer they it be asterisk or footnoted on the big pictograph, so it's loud and proud. But I'll take what we can get. Thank you, Director Harris. Okay, we will now move to introduction item number two. It is 2.49 p.m. and this is called the Satterberg Foundation Elementary Feeder School Grant. This came through the Audit and Finance Committee on May 18th for approval. 
Chief Financial Officer Jolyn Berge, I believe you will be briefing us. Yes, thank you, President DeWolf. So this uh, board action report would accept $950,000 from the Satterberg Foundation to target literacy acceleration at 10 Title I uh, elementary schools that feed into Aki, Demi, and Mercer Middle School pathways. The schools are listed in the bar. Uh, this is the, I believe, the fourth year that this bar has come before the board. Uh, this is will be our fourth year of the grant. Specifically, this grant funds literacy coaches. Um, in audit and finance, we had a good convert. Oh, I should say, I'm sorry. Uh, this work is also in alignment with our strategic plan. So while our 13 priority schools are under the strap plan, have a focus on the lower grades, the Satterberg schools kind of come on top and support those upper grades in those elementary schools. So it is really um, something that we're coordinating with our other efforts. And in audit and finance committee, directors had questions. And so we had made some changes uh, to the bar where we, the smarter balance proficiency growth was listed as percent and they asked that to be changed to percentage points. And they also asked for clarification so nine out of 10 Satterberg schools saw proficiency growth by grade level in percentage points on the smarter balanced English language arts between 1718 and 1819, the two years that we have data for. The one school that did not make growth in percentage points received extra support by the Satterberg team and is on a very positive trajectory. And that would conclude my comments and I would be happy to take questions. Thank you, Chief Berge. I will now move to our directors for questions and comments, starting with the Audit and Finance Committee Chair, Director Hampson. Thank you, President DeWolf. Uh, yeah, we had a good conversation about this. I uh, it, it's I appreciate having the opportunity, uh, although I think it, it, it can be uh, tiresome for staff. I, th I think it's really important to have the opportunity to look at how outside uh, sources of funds are utilized to uh, to to work towards the closing of opportunity gaps, and uh, this is an important source of that funding um, that allows us to to stretch our dollars, for lack of a better term. So I'm grateful to the the, um, the Satterberg Foundation for that, and uh, appreciate the um, the work to. Um, Represent with fidelity the the data um, as it's uh, laid out. I'm glad that we have um, some good data from those schools about progress that's being made, and um, I think that's about all I have. Um, and I'll let other directors that were um, part of audit and finance um, add any of their comments about the the um, the grant. But I, I fully support its acceptance. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hampson. Director Harris. Uh, beyond grateful for their generosity and for sticking with us. And I'm just sorry they're not here so we can't give them a round of applause. And who knows, maybe by the time we pass this and accept it, we can do that and have folks show up to be thanked in person. But this really matters, especially when it's uh, rated with the Nestle Foundation in those middle schools. So um, it's a pipeline and it's a pipeline to success and money does talk. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Next we'll have Director Hersey. Uh, no questions, just huge thank yous and looking forward to it. Next we'll have Director Mack. I just appreciate the targeted supports for literacy that are being provided, and um, um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. Agreed a million. Okay, next we'll go to Director Rankin. Um, just uh, repeat, <laughs> support what everybody said. Um, I know this has been uh, something that our schools and um, communities have benefited from for a while to um, uh, good results. So thank you so much to the Satterberg Foundation and I don't have any questions. Thank you. Okay, Director of Smith. No questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and I have just 
gratitude to the Satterberg Foundation um, and, and um, really great to see those uh, results for those schools. So I don't have any other further questions or comments. So now we'll move to introduction item number three, approval of contracts for specially designed instruction, tutoring services and other comp com compensatory education services, RFQ 02758. This came through audit and finance on May 18th for consideration. Chief of Student Support Services, Dr. Consi Bedrosa, I believe you'll be briefing us today. Yes, I will. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I also have Chief Berge and Director Campbell from the Special Education Department. They're also present as well to answer questions later on. Uh, in terms of this intro action for a specially designed instruction contract, I just want to give a little bit of an update. Um, this is an annual bar um, that is presented for approval each year. Uh, these contracts are in place to provide specialized instruction for students per their individual education plan. Um, while we can't divulge any specific information, but some examples of these services would be students with significant behaviors or students requiring specific mental health supports as an example. And these are services that Seattle Public Schools does not have the ability or staffing to offer, and we are required by by law to meet the IEP needs of the students. Um, I just want to add that at the Audit and Finance Committee meeting, some additional information was requested. Um, there was a question about community engagement. We added language to provide more information on what engagement takes place, which is with the impacted family. We collaborate and we coordinate with individual families to meet the specific needs for each student and support the process of choosing the right vendor to meet the student's individual needs. Um, directors also asked about whether this was a per hour rate change and the rates have not changed at this time. Um, the hourly ra rate ranges from uh, 50 to $50 to $125 per hour. And these rates are negotiated with each vendor. There was a question, and I'm going to leave this one up to um, Chief Berge, but there was a question around racial equity within the RFQ process. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that Chief Berge, do you have any comments about the racial equity process? Um, my comment would be that we're getting this question, and it would be a change overarching about the questions that we ask our vendors during an RFQ or an RFP process, and we would also need to kind of consult with legal about what questions can be asked and how those questions can be rated in the context of an RFP or an RFQ. Thank you. Um, and so um, I've just, I've concluded my comments. Are there any questions? Thank you, Dr. Pedrosa. We will start with uh, our Audit and Finance Committee Chair, Director Hampson. Thank you, President DeWolf. Uh, so we, we did have some good discussion. I know uh, Director Harris will, will um, talk about the, the notion of, provide, of having to contract out for these services um, rather than providing them internally. I think uh, when we have, it's always a debate whether it's curriculum or special education services, um, when it, it makes the most sense to use uh, internal knowledge versus um, external. Uh, in this case, it's it's truly uh, a level of service and expertise that, um, as a parent slash guardian slash advocate that has worked with students uh, navigating um, through any number of these um, different, both this one and the and the next intro item that we'll we'll look at, um, uh, that are that are that need to be served, um, but for which we have no existing structures either in. Um, within the context of our CBA or our funding models that provide the, the um, supports that really allow these students to access um, any form of, of education. And so when uh, the district and families get to this point and, and do these um, through the IEP process and get to the place of, of needing to contract out, it is not a decision that is taken on lightly. Um, it's not preferable. Um, it's what we ultimately get to um, because there's a, a desperate need to serve this student. And so I, I do really sincerely appreciate what the special education department provides um, in terms of getting from that, you know, large group IEP setting with the student and the family um, and ultimately getting to the point of um, 
of a service that that can truly meet the needs of the um, the student. I wish more than anything that we could provide these services internally. It would um, require such a wholesale redesign of our special education services uh, model from from my perspective. Um, and so I'm I'm really grateful that that the district. Um, when we do these things, it's always for a really critical reason, and um, it's a, it's very expensive, um, and it just goes to how great the the need is, and and um, so I hope it's something people will take seriously in terms of how we advocate um, as elected officials for these kinds of services to be more broadly available through our school systems, and but also through um, other agencies um, in the state, um, and that's that's all for me. Thank you, Director Hampson. Next up is Director Harris. Agree with all that Director Hampson had to say, but uh, if memory serves me correctly, for the last four years, uh, previous chiefs or uh, assistant superintendents, whatever, have said that we're making progress and we'll bring this in house at some point. If we're not going to, let's just be honest about it and say so. Um, and let's also, when we're dealing with our legislators and our fine folks at OSPI in Olympia, uh, we already know that the special ed funding is not sufficient and that these critically needed services and oftentimes legally mandated services, well, they're always legally mandated in terms of IDEA, but sometimes they're results of settlements, et cetera, that, that we need more help than we've got now. And we need to raise that up on the priority level. Thank you. Thanks, Director Harris. Next up is Director Hersey. No comments. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Director Rankin. Or excuse me, Director Mack. My apologies. <clears throat> no worries. Thank you. Um, uh, I think two questions. The first is uh, kind of procedural as to why um, <clears throat> the items on the agenda today, three, four, five, six, and seven, are all, um, you know, kind of combining various special education services. And I'm just curious why they're all broken out and not combined, or if it's possible to combine them. Um, it feels very um, disjointed when there's a, a number of these. I mean, maybe having it individually discussed is one thing, but I'm um, curious to know why they're set up in separate board actions. Director Mack, if it were all combined, you'd be upset about that because of the transparency. <laughs> Director Harris. <laughs> Maybe so. And actually, Director Mack, we did discuss that in um, audit and finance. And uh, my understanding is that the RFQ process is different for each of these categories. Um, I, you know, agree that it would be easier to approve them together. But my understanding is that this is broken out because they are, in fact, uh, different RFQs. Okay, but great. Let, Thank um, you. That's that's fine. I just was curious about that. My um, other question, though, specific to this number three bar is um, in the board action, it does um, list the number of students served per um, agency or organization. Um, and I think that's something that we had in previous years asked to be included so that we had a sense of you know, the magnitude. Um, what I don't have a sense of though is, are there more or fewer students this year than last year and actually kind of the corollary is are any students that were previously um, uh, experiencing these or having these services have they been exited and um, are no longer having these services I'm going to um, have uh, Director Campbell speak on that. Director Campbell? Hi there, thank you. Um, yes, um, these services are often services that students may use for a, a brief period of time. 
or these services are, are services that a student may require through the duration of their education. So, so the, the number of students served under this bar is about the same um, as it's been in previous years. Um, the reason why it's hard to really pinpoint a number is because of the nature of the IEP process where students come into service and then they may no longer need the service. So that that it's a, it's a little bit more fluid when we're talking about these specially designed instruction um, services under this bar. Uh, just, just to clarify what you just said, so the total number of students being served is still approximately the same, but uh, whether or not they're the same students that um, previously were receiving these services and uh, no longer are is is undetermined or you don't know that's that's correct so this these services may be on like a, a student receives their IEP their an IEP team determines that a student requires this level of service um, and then really the goal is for that student to become more independent this may be a temporary service that is placed to that is put on the IEP and then the IEP meets again and they determine the student no longer needs that service. So these these services that are under this category tend to be, a, um, they, they can um, change based on the student's needs. So it's around the same amount of students that are being served um, as, as it's been in previous years. Um, the, the students are not the same. I think I answered yeah, your question. Yeah, thank you. Director Mack, I'm not no, sure. That, that's enough. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Director Mack. All right, Director Rankin. Hi. Um, I uh, just, yeah, I wanted to um, kind of respond generally to a couple things I heard other, other directors say. Um, which was uh, Director Hampson's comment about needing to, you know, to, to allow for some of these to be provided in house, we would need to completely redo how we deliver special education services. Um, nothing would please me more than to do that. Uh, but given our, our current structure, um, where we send students to services instead of services to students, um, th that isn't possible. Um, so I know that some of these services are for, you know, very much more highly impacted students um, than uh, is the average need of a student receiving special education services. Um, I think it's important to remember that special education services are, and the IDEA protects students' rights to access free and appropriate public education. Um, so, uh, you know, if if someone sees this and thinks like, oh, that's so much money, you know, why did that family get that? It's it's not a it's not a luxury service. It's actually that student or this group of students requires much more support in order to access the education that um, that they're typically developing peers are accessing. Uh, I also want to just say, you know, I'm not sure the different RFPs or RFQs um, require them to be broken out, but I also just generally really appreciate seeing them broken out because these are very, very different services um, for totally different needs. So the item three that we're looking at right now, you know, that is one where I would be more interested uh, or interested in knowing how those are things we could maybe bring, you know, ha be provided by Seattle Public Schools in some way at some point. Um, but therapeutic day service, you know, a, an agreement with a hospital, residential uh, placement, those are things that are, are just, you know, we can't as a district provide that. And it doesn't even, it doesn't really make sense for us to, even if we could, just based on um, the very uh, specialized services and support and programs that have been built up around meeting the needs of a child that might need that. Um, and and the the relatively low number of children that would need to access that it it wouldn't it makes a lot more sense for 
a smaller number of entities to provide those highly specialized services rather than every school district try to um, do that for the, the small number of students that they may or, or some years may not have. Um, and so, um, yeah, I just, I appreciate getting to see this information and um, kind of put a, a um, not, not a face because obviously the kids are, it's private information, but just to really have the opportunity to not only obviously approve the funds, but also just acknowledge and talk about all the different type, the range of services and supports that um, students and families are seeking and need access to. And, um, you know, I think a lot of times these families feel very invisible and very powerless. So um, I just I just kind of want to make note that this really it's not extra. It's not <laughs> it's not something that, um, you know, people are are trying to get. It's it's these children and these families need and deserve this support um, to access the education that are um, typically developing students have access to and so um it's it's really important and so i just yeah thanks thank you director Rankin. director of medicine thank you um i so we did have a great conversation about this um in and aspen i appreciate it i really don't have much to add that people didn't know to cover um just to say that um we were definitely concerned or you know we were looking into the you know, Community engagement piece of this, and I see that has been expanded on. Um, but it, you know, it's still the takeaway was still sort of for me that it focuses a lot more on vendor engagement um, and not so much with direct engagement with this with any advocacy groups like such as um, Seattle Special Ed, PTSA, or things like that. Um, groups that can give us that insight. I see that obviously we're engaging with the families who receive these services, of which there are very few. So um, it's hard to argue with that. But just looking at um, in, in as people were saying, all these bars seem to be uh, on the same sort of vein of, of need and um, what the contracts entail. So um, just knowing that we perhaps do give a look at how we're engaging with community in these, as opposed to leaving it to a kind of like almost a financial viewpoint perspective of doing it for the RFQs. Um, but that is all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Director of Smith. <clears throat> Um, sorry, sorry, uh, President DeWolf, it's Director Rankin. Can I ask, a, throw in another question? Uh, certainly. Um, I have a curiosity um, in general that can be answered offline for uh, Dr. Pedrosa and Director Campbell. Um, I have curiosity about the uh, demographic information for students receiving these services. If there's a way that the board can view that without um, compromising student identity. Um, I am very curious about uh, the provisions of these services and ensuring that um, they're being equitably applied or if there's other information that might help us better serve students by knowing that um, that the racial information. Uh, so I guess that's just a request. It doesn't have to be answered now. OK, thank you. Thank I was just going to interject that we have we do keep that data, and so I'll work with the team to figure out how to get it to you in a in a in a in a good time frame. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Petrosa. Uh, and um, my question, uh, well, I guess is first a statement, which I I believe that special education services are basic education. Uh, I also understand that we um, are not being fully reimbursed for this form of basic education. So I was curious if either Dr. Perdosa or Chief Berge could provide the gap between what we provide in special education services and what the state reimburses us, because I know there's a large millions, millions of dollars of gap. And if it's not easily available now, I can wait till action. Director DeWolf, this is Jolene. Um, you know, the state is shorting us about $70 million a year. That's the that's how much more we pay. And then as far as these contracts, the way the state, state funding formula works is funny. It's either if you have super expensive kids, there's a whole other mechanism to go ahead and get service paid for with through safety net. So a very high, high cost student 
can be almost fully reimbursed for us, where a student that is maybe $5,000 or $10,000 above what the state provides is not. Thank you. Okay, we will move to, uh, it is doing a time check, it's 3.15. We will move on to introduction item number four, approval of contracts for therapeutic day treatment service. This came to the Audit and Finance Committee on May 18th. Approval. Dr. Pedrosa, I believe you will be briefing us again. Yes, I will. So similar in the same vein, just um, just to um, let everyone know, this is also an annual bar that is presented for approval each year. Um, these contracts are in place to provide therapeutic treatment services that SP SPS is not, Seattle Public Schools is unable to provide um, in the comprehensive school settings. Um, these services are determined by students' IEP teams, and we are legally mandated to provide as determined by the IEP teams. Um, just in response to what the board asked previously in regards to this bar, what are these services? Um, therapeutic day treatment services support students in academic and social emotional areas in a separate educational setting. Um, due to FERPA concerns, we are unable to share specific examples in this setting, but could provide more information individually. And that concludes my comments, if there's any comments or um, questions. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll start with Director Hampson, who is our Audit and Finance Committee Chair. Yeah, I made, uh, basically combined my comments um, under the last intro item, so um, nothing uh, additional from me. Thank you. Understood. Thank you. Director Harris. Uh, go ahead and, and box up all of my comments to the same ones okay. for issues number four through Seven. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you, Director Harris. Director Hersey. No comments from me. We can keep going. Thank you. Director Mack. Uh, I'm just curious to know on this one if there is an increase in the number of students uh, year over year for this uh, board action. For therapeutic treatment? Mm hmm. Director Campbell, can you answer that question, please? I sure can. Um, there are approximately the same number of students that are being treated in therapy or that receive their services in therapeutic day service placements. So a slight change up or down per year, but typically the same number of students. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Director Mack? Yes, thank you. Director Rankin. Nope. Thank you, Director Devetta Smith. I'm so sorry, no questions for me. <laughs> no worries, uh, and I have no questions at this time. Okay, we'll move on to introduction item number five, approval of agreement with Seattle Children's Hospital for hospital-based educational services. This came through Audit and Finance Committee on May 18th for approval. Dr. Pedrosa, I believe you'll be briefing us once more. Yes, um, again, this is a, also an annual bar that is presented for approval each year. Um, Seattle Children's Hospital provides hospital-based instruction in the form of tutoring as supported by OSPI funds. Per state law, we are required to act as a flow-through agency for Seattle's Children's Hospital to access the OSPI funds to support the education of the students at Children's Hospital. As the flow-through agency, Seattle Public School processes the education payments and reports yearly to OSPI. And that concludes my comments. Thank you. And I believe Director Hampson and Director Harris have um, said that their comments apply to this, so I'll move to Director Hersey. Actually, Director Duell. I'm sorry, Director Hampson, go ahead. Audit Finance Committee Chair. Yeah, I said that for the last time. But for this one, um, I did want to just note um, for the, the record um, that uh, though we have no uh, influence over the programming uh, that occurs at this site because we are a pass-through entity, I do think uh, it's worth exercising our um, our. our modest influence and discussing um, with OSPI about the cultural appropriateness of that programming at Children's Hospital, the experience from families, um, as this is in, in my district, in my community, 
um, that are uh, furthest from educational justice has been that uh, they've struggled struggled to find them uh, it to be a culturally responsive environment. Um, and so I plan to take that um, those questions at an appropriate time to OSPI. Thank you, Director Hanson. Director Hersey. No questions. Director Mack. No questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rinkin. Yeah, um, I uh, we have a policy in place. So this doesn't, as Director Hansen was saying, um, in terms of the content or what the service is that we're passed through. Um, I am wondering though how this dovetails with um, our we our policy around students at a hospital that uh, provides. I think it's mostly just kind of canned online curriculum and access to a tutor of some sort. Um, uh, so I'm, I am curious about that. Uh, and I also, in terms of hospital-based educational services, um, in thinking about uh, something that Director, and ha Director Hampson and I had discussed uh, the need for in Seattle Public Schools pre COVID is a, a more robust distance learning policy um, that provides access. It, it, that's that's more than a policy that gives permission essentially for a student to access something that's completely online without um, a classroom teacher, but that would move us towards uh, a distance learning policy um, whereby a student with an extended hospital stay or home home stay or on uh, un, un, they're un, unable to to attend school um, for an extended period of time for whatever reason. Um, I would really like to see this type of thing incorporated into a distance learning policy so that a student staying at the hospital, um, if they wanted to and if they were able to, could somehow participate uh, in more of a um, classroom schedule. So I'm just sort of putting that out there in uh, the general the general sphere that I know that a distance learning policy is is <laughs> now n now there's a little more urgency around it. Whereas before, <laughs> um, uh, when we brought it up, it was you know positively received, but not seen as something urgent. It is pretty urgent. Um, but I think uh, not only in the context of, of students being at home right now in the midst of a global pandemic, but also for a child who is um, in non-pandemic times uh, away from school for a time. Um, I would like us to be able to to find ways to influence or have control over what what we can provide to them more than um, this kind of agreement of a pass through, so that uh, kids can stay connected with their classmates and their schools and their teachers. Um, so that's it. Thank you, Director Rankin. Director DeBetta Smith. No questions or comments for me. Thank you. Thank you. And I have none at this time as well. Thank you, Dr. Pedrosa. So now let's move to introduction item number six. This is approval of contact tracks for sign language interpreter vendors RFQ 11641. This came through Audit and Finance Committee on May 18th for approval. Dr. Pedrosa, you again. Yes, thank hey, you. Uh, excuse me. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Really quickly no, before we move on, just giving a heads up at three, oh, excuse me, at fourth. I'm on different time. In about seven minutes, I'm gonna have to hop out to um, take a call with a student from Federal Way. So if I sign off, that is why. Understood, thank you, Director Hersey. Thank you. Um, so this is the annual bar that is presented annually. Um, Seattle Public School students with individual education programs may require uh, sign language interpretation services. And at times the district is unable to provide um, that service. So uh, we do. Uh, while we do uh, have a staff of ASL interpreters, um, SPS is not able to recruit and hire enough sign language interpreters to meet all of the needs of our students. But that concludes my uh, comments. Thank you, Dr. Pedrosa. Now we'll start with Director Hampson, Audit and Finance Committee Chair. Uh, yeah, so um, back to kind of some of the other um, comments. Um, I didn't have any specific um, comments or questions about this item. Thank you. 
Um, and and did I did I skip one, folks? I want to make sure I. Approval contracts. Did I skip number five? Which is Seattle Children's Hospital. No, you didn't skip it. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. They're all they're just these five are blending together. Um, apologies, Director Harris. I'm sorry. You actually said you're good through seven. So, Director Hersey. No additional questions from me. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. No questions on this bar. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. No questions. Thank you, Director Rivera Smith. No questions from me. Thank you, and none from me here, Dr. Pedrosa. So now we'll move to introduction item number seven approval of residential contracts with the New England Center for Children and Lake Mary Center. This came through Audit and Finance Committee on May 18th for approval. Dr. Pedrosa, one last time. Yes, thank you. And I'll, I'll just repeat that this is an annual bar that is presented annually for approval. Um, these contracts are in place to provide residential services that we are unable to provide in Seattle Public Schools comprehensive school settings. Um, these services are determined by students IEP teams and we are legally mandated to provide these services. Students who receive services in residential settings are served out of state and at school out of state and uh, we are, are unable to give specific or detailed information due to FERPA considerations. Thank you. All right, we'll start with Director Hampson, our Audit and Finance Committee Chair. Hi, yeah, just repeat the um, my gratitude that we're able to support families in finding these options, particularly given that they, that they don't exist um, closer to home. That's gotta be one of the hardest decisions that um, school um, communities and particularly families have to make. Um, so I'm grateful that we're able to do this. And I'll pass it on. Thanks, Director Hampson. Next, we'll move to Director Hersey. I'm just echoing uh, Director Hampson's sentiment. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and step off to meet with my student. And I hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Director Hersey. Director Mack. No questions. Thank you. I'm sorry, did, did I not come through? I had no questions. Thank you. Thanks, Director Mack. Next up is Director uh, Rankin. Uh, yeah, I, uh, to echo what Director Hansen said, um, that these uh, residential contracts that we have through Seattle First Families and Students in Seattle Public Schools are very, very far away because Washington State does not um, does not uh, has not invested in making these resources available to people here where they live. And um, while it's a good thing that we're able to still provide services for these kids, um, I really can't imagine having a child in need of this care and these services um, and and having the only choice be to send them, um, you know, a six hour flight away from me. Um, so I, that's just sort of a general call out to our state legislature that um, we don't, we don't have the resources in our state to serve the residents of our state um, with this type of service. And also just, um, we have a role gap in mental health care and counseling in general, especially for children. Thank you, Director Rankin. Director Rivera Smith. No questions or comments for me. Thank you. Understood. Thank you. And I have no questions uh, as well, Dr. Bergerosa, but thank you for sticking with us and um, for all of your um, support. Thank you. You guys have a great afternoon. Thank you. We'll now move to introduction item number eight review and approval of the 2020 Career and Technical Education Annual Plan per board policy number 2170. This came through curriculum and instruction on May 19th for approval. So, Chief Academic Officer Dr. Diane DeBacker, I believe you'll be briefing us today. Thank you, President DeWolf. Can you confirm that you hear me? We do hear you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the CET 
or the CTE plan. Um, this is part of a requirement under policy 2170 that requires that we annually share this plan with you. And for the past three years, um, we have organized this plan around the seven strategies as shown on the plan or in the plan beginning on page five and through page 13. And this year, we've also included our five-year plan that we submit to OSPI. A few highlights uh, for the plan that you may be interested in. An overview of enrollment. We have seen an increase in overall headcount across all the CTE programs in middle school, high school, and at the Seattle Skills Center over the past five years. But there may be some questions about the chart that you see within the bar because it looks like the headcount's going down. That's actually due to a change in how we had to calculate uh, full-time enrollment um, that was changed through a WAC revision a few years ago. So we can answer more about that if anybody's interested. We're also very happy and pleased with how the racial equity analysis has um, come into play during this particular year's bar. Um, it's, it's amazing what a difference a year makes. Um, I think about as we brought this plan to the board last year, we didn't have really our strategic plan in place, not the way that we have it now. Um, part of the strategic plan we commonly refer to as goals four and five, which is uh, ninth grade on track and college and career ready. And we know that our students furthest from educational justice, especially our African-American males, um, are really highlighted in the plan and also in our CTE plan that we have here. Um, we have tried to promote enrollment for students further from educational, and just, uh, educational justice by making sure that we have seven sustainable pathways as you've seen within this plan. We also are doing direct marketing and recruitment to students. Um, we're working with an agency that conducted focus groups around student interest in CTE and I know that in the past and with past boards, they've been very interested in how do we increase enrollment and how do we make sure that students are aware that these opportunities are for them. Another thing that has happened in the past year is the, um, the community workforce agreement that the board has worked very hard on and ensuring that we are able to offer our students some opportunities with some um, very um, lucrative positions in Seattle in, in some of our CTE areas. We also had the uh, summit last year with our industry partners, which allowed us to open the doors and work with more partners in um, all areas of the continuum of CTE from having introduction to different careers to all the way up to doing internships. Um, this was presented at CNI a few weeks ago, and we did have some questions, and we responded to those questions. Um, one of those was around the uh, breakout for the ethnicity and race of our CTE educators, so we have added that in. Um, we have also um, talked about how there is the intersection between the Student Community Workforce Agreement and our Skills Center. Um, we also on page five about the participation of our special ed students. So we have addressed that in terms of percentages. Um, and I believe that that is enough of introduction at this point. Um, I want to give thanks uh, to Caleb Perkins and his team, uh, Jane and Dan and others for the work that they put into this. And I think that some of them are on the line too if we have specific questions. That's all from me, President DeWolf. Thank you, Dr. Diane DeBacker. We will now move to directors for questions and comments, starting with our Curriculum and Instruction Policy Committee Chair, Director Rankin. Thank you. Yeah, we had um, a great uh, explanation or presentation of this in our last committee meeting. And um, uh, yeah, super big shout out to Caleb Perkins and Jane Hendrickson. And um, the Dan, whose last name Dan Goldsman, uh, uh, Ms. Hendrickson in particular was so enthusiastic and supportive and excited to share um, about the work of this of the CTE program that it was just um, it was a really nice bright spot, honestly, in a lot of kind of 
stuff that's happening right now to um, to hear the passion for our students and uh, how participation is going. Um, it was really, really great. And uh, it was particularly, as uh, Dr. DeBacker said about the racial equity piece, um, it was really awesome to see uh, how much, how, how closely the demographics of the students participating in CTE um, mirror the demographics of our district, um, including in special education. So uh, I think it's, it's great that these opportunities are being made available and that we're um, working hard like to really advertise and reach students instead of it just being like a thing that's available. Um, because as we know, these are, you know, uh, can lead to highly skilled careers, really well paid union family wage work. Um, so I just really appreciated uh, the presentation and, um, and I'm excited to keep talking about it. So thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. All right, well, next we'll move to Director Hampson. Hi, thank you. Um, I appreciated uh, this presentation um, and the read. I think my my primary question has to do with um, kind of how the distance learning um, digital education component works. And I saw it presented, but I was having a hard time uh, kind of grokking the, the, the proposed transition um, or what what ex the expectations are for how this would look. It it looked in the presentation like it was something that would be developed over a period of four years versus um, there being a, a more comprehensive plan for a, the distance learning version of this for 2020 to 21. Um, and maybe that's because like everything that we're trying to plan for for next year, we don't know exactly what the possibilities are. Um, or, or if there will be in-person possibilities. So, so I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Um, how did you weave that into this presentation? So this is Jane Hendrickson. Thank you so much for uh, having me here today. And I will talk to the CTE piece. Um, so as far as transition of courses, um, you know, during this COVID, um, you know, crisis and into looking at what next year might look like. Um, our, our CTE teachers and our courses have transitioned. I mean, fortunately for us in CTE, a lot of it is, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, influence of technology in what we do. Um, we do have some challenges in, in a couple of different areas. One of those is our worksite learning, which is our internship program. Um, and so, and looking at what that will look like for students moving forward, um, and certainly ones who are already in that place. And we were able to transition that as well into, um, you know, and honoring their work um, starting in March. And so our teachers have been very creative. Um, I've seen some major, uh, major innovation um, happening um, across all of our buildings. One of the, the areas though we, we do look at um, and how we will uh, address best works is in our labs, in our skilled based labs. And so uh, that is definitely one area that um, is, we're actively talking about how do we move towards that and what does that look like moving forward for next year? So our, our four year plan is it's definitely looking at the future, right? So how do we address uh, digital learning um, in this area? And this is something we had to, to pivot real quick. Um, so, you know, moving forward, what does that look like for us is is definitely in, in our forefront of our discussion right now. And Director Hampson, this is Dan Goldsman, Principal of the Skill Center. I can add a, a little bit more detail if you like um, for the immediate uh, this summer for the Skill Center and just give an example, a concrete example. Um, and yeah, great question. It's it's not easy to do hands-on learning in a remote setting, uh, but one strategy that we've been using this year uh, or you know this spring, um, and we'll continue in the summer for our medical classes like nursing and uh, medical office assistant in our in our summer class, the intro to medical careers. We're looking into uh, purchasing uh, sets of stethoscopes and uh, blood pressure cuffs for each student, and then we'll deliver those to the students so that they can use those at home, practice on their family, practice on themselves, and, and still get that hands-on experience, but at a, in a remote um, uh, way uh, following the governor's orders. And so 
Uh, additionally, we're planning on having uh, daily Teams or Zoom class time for each uh, class, um, at least you know one or two hours a day on Teams, um, and then independent work in between those uh, those meetings, so that there will still be some face-to-face -face, uh, classroom time, some hands-on learning, and some equipment that they can get used to and use. Does that answer your question, Director Harris? Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next is Director Harris. Yeah, I'd like to know how many internships we managed to get post that conference that we had at the Ports Conference Center where lots and lots of promises were made. Did we follow up? Did we snag them? Jane? Yes, this is Jane Hendrickson. So yeah, so a little bit, we are pivoting so that because of COVID, we had uh, many of our partners that we scheduled out for summertime have pulled back and that, and we certainly have an understanding that um, they are, you know, trying to um, re rethink about how they're hiring back their own staffing um, in a lot of these ways. However, we do have skilled trades uh, launch 206 um, companies still on board for this summer. So we do have, um, I believe at, uh, this is active conversation. Uh, I believe there's four companies at this time and there is definitely talk about uh, connecting with the city as well uh, to bring their internship uh, their internship program uh, on um, on par with our launch 206. So that's an active conversation with our city partners um, as of yesterday. And if we could have more frequent communication and raw raw in the Friday memo, nobody loves success like success, and it breeds more. Please, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Next up, we'll have Director Hersey. Oh, excuse me. Uh, next up, we'll have Director Mack. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, CTE is so important, and I'm I'm excited to see a plan that is um, looking to expand and, uh, in particular, consider uh, providing <clears throat> expanded services through uh, Rainier Beach when it's re renovated and. Uh, having those conversations now about how to um, increase our CTE offerings and engage students. Um, so really, uh, uh, this report's very thorough and uh, really appreciate all the work that went into it. Um, my one question is related to uh, maritime CTE pathway and um, the engagement or conversation um, about how our students may access uh, that pathway um, once, I believe, it is it Highline who is, who is planning on um, implementing a, a high school or is it a different district? I can't it's remember which district. Highline, but. Highline, this is Director Rankin. Highline will manage it, and um, but it's it's in cooperation. We, we have... Um, Seattle Public Schools is included. And that, so that's the clarification that I'd like to have is um, exactly how that works for Seattle Public Schools students or will work in the future. Yeah, this is Diane and that is, um, that's still being discussed um, as, I mean, obviously some of it, the progress slowed down a little because of COVID but the Maritime High School is still being discussed through the Port of Seattle. And yes, Highline would be the sponsoring district. And each district, probably uh, they're talking about the roadmap districts that are in this region, would each have a, a certain number of slots of students that they could send to the Maritime High School. But all of, all of the details are, you know, we, we really haven't had any discussions since COVID. Closure. And and I can thank you, Dr. DeBecker. This is Dan Goldsman, Skill Center Director. I can add a, a little bit of uh, detail, kind of in the in the immediate future. As you know, you know, fortunately, we have our maritime vessel operations course that we run out of Seattle Maritime Academy. Uh, we have the summer course and we have the school year course. So um, in a normal year, we expect you know at least uh, 25 or more students uh, to run through our summer programs. 
and uh, you know we're working on getting more and more students in the in the school year class. Um, so you know presently we certainly have a, a, a pathway for students interested in in maritime vessel operations. Um, and then of course there's you know students at Ballard High School have access to those programs as well. Uh, but you know our our goal is uh, as part of the Youth Maritime Collaborative, who you know as as the port uh, is also part of that Youth Maritime Collaborative, we're all working together to make sure that we're really just expanding opportunities for students. So that's you know anything from those summer, well even anything from those spring break trips, like we did this last year. Um, we didn't get to do our spring break trip, but we did our winter uh, midwinter break uh, experience learning experience for students in maritime you know, all the way up to um, advanced skill center classes or eventually those high school, uh, the options for high school that, that Highline is considering hosting. Thank you, appreciate the information. No further questions for me. Thanks, Director Mack. Director Rivetta Smith. Thank you, um, I would just add on, I know it's already been mentioned that we're, we're super excited and we want to celebrate um, CTE program for having such a representative demographics that mirror our, our, our district as a whole. Um, also wanted to just give a quick rec and recognize that we don't talk much about how CTE, um, how CTE is um, exploration is, in, is represented in elementary schools, but I noticed in here that it says we do have um, Amazon First Robotics in 20 elementary schools, so I'm really excited to see that. And I'm happy to know that, that it's starting there. And um, also just one small piece to just add on. I mentioned this in committee that on page 18, there are some, some um, just, I feel like I'm being copy editor police today, but there's some um, repeat clauses in the 2020-21 column. The first, second, and a little bit of the third bullet are then repeated again in that same column. So just a uh, little cleanup there, I guess. But otherwise, it looks great. Thank you for all the work and information. No further questions or comments. Thank you, Director Devetta Smith. And I just have a few quick questions. Um, it mentioned something about a mentoring program. Can you share a little bit more about that? It, it, it's on. Uh, it's within the um, background. Well, equity analysis. It talks about the mentoring program. The short-term goal is that every SPS African American. Yes. It, I, yep. Yep. Uh, is that you, Dr. Perkins? Yes. I yes, can minutes. That's part of the strap plan. I'll just I'll tee it up a little yeah. bit. That's part of the strap plan um, in uh, as we refer to as goals four and five. So go ahead, Dr. Kate Perkins. Yes, thank you. I uh, just wanted to add that, as Dr. DeBacker said, you know, what a difference a year makes. So our strategic plan work has overlapped heavily with the CT planning work. So in developing initiatives for goal five around career readiness, um, as has been shared in CNI, one of the key initiatives is going to be around mentoring that Dr. Williams's team will be leading up. And that mentoring uh, has been informed by a work group that includes many of our former and current CTE partners. Um, so it is part of the overall effort to implement goal five is to ultimately provide mentors uh, to all of our African-American male uh, ninth grade students um, so that they can consider both post-secondary options in terms of college as well as career. Um, so we thought that would be important to include in the CTE plan um, as, a, as a close connection between the strategic plan work and our CTE plan. Thank you. And um, the other curiosity I had was, it mentions about we launched our new medical and health course pathway at Rainier Beach, Garfield, and Nathan Hale this year, and we'll be expanding access to this high demand pathway. Um, in 2021, and one of those includes Seattle World School. So, I just a couple questions of um, how how are you justifying that it's high demand? I don't necessarily disagree, but how do we know it's high demand? And particularly at Seattle World School, um, do you happen have a sense about if it will be uh, in additional languages or other different supports um, for students there? I'll I'll start with the high demand question, and then I'll ask Ms. Hendrickson to connect on, um, on on the connection to Seattle World School. Just one thing that Seattle and King County has a lot of is a lot of analysis on labor statistics and one that, uh, you know, database that we've taken advantage of that now Washington STEM helps develop is just a projection 
of all the future careers in the in the area of uh, in the Puget Sound area as well as in Washington State, um, and we can share that tool per Director Harris's idea maybe of a Friday board memo. But just there's a lot of data on projected job growth in the area, which of course evolves. Uh, but health and medical is is routinely uh, in the top three of those areas uh, where that where we project. Um, those family wage jobs that will be in high demand uh, going forward. So that's how we're basing it. We're, we're relying on labor statistics that others have analyzed. Understood. So I will answer to the second part of that question at Seattle World School specifically. I, I, they are our newest um, add-on uh, to our um, to launching this program next year. So we're working very closely. Um, with our principal at Seattle World School, who assured us that um, all of their teachers are um, prepared to work with students of different languages. And so, and that was the uniqueness of, of that particular um, school. So that was, um, so again, this is, this is a fairly new decision um, based on uh, students' interest um, and enrollment, uh, a previous or a initial enrollment or interest um, uh, sheets. And so uh, we just began working with Seattle World School in the last, mm, I would say since COVID. So in the last uh, four weeks, four or five weeks. Thank you. And then mm -hmm. my last question is about, uh, it also says, for example, as you will see in strategy one, we continue our efforts to increase access for students furthest from educational justice to non-traditional pathways such as health and medical, which we just described, skills trade, skilled trades and IT slash STEM. Mm -hmm. My question is, um, what are we actually doing to increase access for students? Is there more money? Are there more classrooms? Is there more, are there more teachers? Um, are we just using that word or is there actual something that illustrates that we are increasing that access? So uh, thank you, that's a great question. I appreciate you asking. Absolutely, we are targeting uh, funding to our high demand pathways. Uh, and most specifically looking at our schools that are in greatest need. Uh, and so, yes, we, we support staffing, we support equipment purchases, we, we're supporting um, uh, marketing um, and working with the schools uh, to make sure that we are at, uh, in this case, a little bit differently this year because we didn't have our, our family nights, um, but we are working at, um, uh, not only our feeder schools into those high schools, uh, but we're bringing in industry career panels um, to those middle schools as well. So we are definitely targeting um, not only time and effort, but we also have our industry um, advisories that are working on career connected learning outreach activities um, to engage students at those middle schools um, interest in wanting to register into that program. Thank you. Thank you very yep. much. Yeah, absolutely. Then those are all my questions and comments. So now we'll move to introduction item number nine. This is VEX four, excuse me, approval of budget transfer and award contract P5132, bid number B012042 to CDK Construction Services Inc. for the Whitman Middle School Seismic Improvements Project. This came through Operations Committee on April 27th for consideration. And I believe we have Director of Capital Projects and Planning Richard Best. Uh, briefing us. Uh, correct, Director DeWolf. I'm going to check and make sure you can hear me. We can. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are recommending that uh, the, the contract be awarded to CDK. CDK is the low responsive bidder, or I should say low responsive responsible bidder. Um, Seattle Public Schools received seven bids for this project. Um, the low bid amount was $1,560,000. Uh, this is to implement um, priority one, so life safety seismic improvements at Whitman Middle School. Uh, these are voluntary seismic improvements. I want to be clear um, with all the school board members, this will not bring the school up to uh, current seismic codes, but it will um, uh, implement life safety uh, seismic, seismic improvements throughout the school. Um, we do need to budget transfer, and the budget transfer amount for this is from the BEX-4 program contingency, and it's $53,871. And so with that, I will open it up to questions. Thank you, Richard. Okay, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll move on to directors and for comments and questions, starting with our operations committee chair, Director Mack. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Best. Um, 
there's a a few questions that have come through via fax around some of these contracts um, related to uh, why the bid documents are not included. Um, I think that question comes for 9, 10, 11, 12, many of those, and on down the line. So um, if you could clarify um, uh, the question of why the bid Bid information is is or is not included in this uh, bar at this time. So, about a year ago, um, Director Mack, um, uh, Capital Projects and consult Consultation with Legal Counsel um, concerning the ADA Consent Decree, started making bid tabulation um, forms available in the Capital Projects Office. Um, we do not um, have not been attaching them to the. Uh, board action request forms because um, of their um, they are not ADA accessible and so it requires you know yet another cover sheet be placed on we've just made folks aware that they are available in our office if um, the public has an interest in seeing them uh, are, and are, are they posted somewhere online or not no they're not posted online they, I, I believe there is a copy in the board office, and then they're available in the capital projects office. Um, and uh, this changed from a year ago. A year ago, we used to we, include them, and now uh, we're not. As part of our ADA consent decree, we do not. We no longer include those um, bid tabulation forms um, with our documents. We just um, note who the low bidder is. And this has been consistent practice over the last year? Yes, it's been consistent practice for probably more than a year, but safe to say a year. Okay, great. Um, thank you for that clarification. I'm not sure if I have any concerns around that practice or not. Um, I just wanted to daylight uh, that that question was raised, and that's the, the reason for why that um, does not exist here. Um, Specific to this bar, there was also a question about why a one-time transfer from the BEX4 contingency fund. Um, and then I'll kind of tack on to that as to, um, well, I guess I, I share that same question as to why are we tapping into the contingency fund for this project. Uh, the project bid just slightly over what our estimate was when we did an analysis of the overall project budget we thought it important to daylight to the school board that we'd need a tr transfer of funds um, and it's fifty three thousand eight hundred and seventy one dollars uh, just based upon um, the the low responsive bidder uh, paying some additional Washington State sales tax paying some additional um, uh, project permit costs, and then uh, placing just a small amount of funds in the um, construction contingency for the project. And it is and slightly over, I want to emphasize to the school board members, it's just slightly over um, our um, architect's estimate. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the last thing I'll say, and I'll just uh, say this for the future ones coming up too, to not repeat it again, but all of these that had required bid information um, are up for consideration because when we discuss these uh, projects and ops, um, those uh, processes had not yet been um, done yet, and so the, the, the information was not yet complete. Um, and with that, uh, I'll allow other folks to ask any questions or raise any concerns. Thanks, Director Mack. Next up is Director Hampson. No questions from me. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Director, Her Director Harris. Uh, no questions from me, and I have to bail as the other job uh, called. Mm -hmm. My apologies, and... Nope. Uh, Great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Yes, I know an apology. Apologies, we had a jam-packed schedule today, so um, appreciate you. Director Rankin. No questions for me. Thank you. Director Devera Smith. Thank you. I have uh, just a question to follow up on the on the attachments question. Uh, I was wondering what if um, 
or if Richard best could explain maybe what it would take to be able to attach those. What, what, what would we need to make those ADA compliant and get those attached? Um, it would, uh, Director um, Rivera-Smith, it would take just revising the forms that we have that we've utilized for our bid tabulation forms. I could work with our um, contracting services to do that um, so that they are, um, you know, uh, potentially um, um, ADA. Um, I know we've had conversations about this in the past. We've looked at this in the past and the determination was made to just make them available upon request to our office. So, but I could review that again and get that information to you. Right. And I could include that in a Friday memo to the board. Yeah, and I think if the committee, you know, decides that is a priority, um, that would be great to look into, but thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I have no questions, uh, Mr. Best. Thank you. Next up, we'll move to introduction item number 10, BEX 5, award contract P5145 for athletic field lighting projects at Whitman Middle School. This came through the operations committee on April 27th for consideration. Mr. Best, um, you'll be briefing us again. Thank you. So the Whitman Middle School field lighting project, we are recommending be awarded to KCDA and Musco Lighting in the amount of $757,256. Um, KCDA is a purchasing cooperative and has bid uh, field lighting. If um, and if Seattle Public Schools were to bid lighting, Musco would be the only um, competitor that would meet um, the city of Seattle's light spill requirements. And so KCDA has a competitive situation in which um, they have bid uh, and received uh, pricing from several different um, field lighting firms in which Musco uh, was their low bid. Um, and so it allowed for a competitive situation utilizing the KCDA purchasing cooperative um, for this purchase. Um, I would note that uh, this is placing field lights um, at Whitman Middle School. Historically, we have had field lights placed at our high schools. Um, when the decision was made by the school board to implement um, a later start time at high schools, one of the require uh, one of the uh, problems identified in the programmatic EIS was community and uh, access to our fields. The way um, Seattle Public Schools is responding to community access to our fields is to increase the amount of fields that we have lit by adding um, middle schools to um, field lighting. I will also note that we did add field lighting projects at Ballard High School, Roosevelt, Franklin, Cleveland, Garfield, and Robert Eagle Staff Middle School. So this is just a continuation of that uh, program to address this um, uh, programmatic environmental impact impact statement um, condition. So um, this at Whitman Middle School will um, light both the soccer field, soccer football field, and the softball baseball field mm -hmm. um, and provides 11 light poles, um, nine of them which are 80 feet, I think, and two which are 70 feet. And I think that narrative, yeah. Uh, is in the in the background information. I'll open it up to questions, Director DeWolf. Thank you. All right, we'll start, we'll start with Director Mack, uh, Operations Committee Chair. Yes, thank you. Um, we've passed in the uh, pre with previous boards a number of field lighting projects and that the um, new lighting uh, systems are more directive and have less spillage, so they're not as bright and um, uh, challenging for neighbors. Uh, we have gotten some uh, community questions and comments around the community engagement around this project and the impact of the light, um, as well as whether or not the environmental impact um, uh, or environmental impact statement has been done, uh, CEPA requirements, et cetera. Can you briefly go over what community engagement 
uh, has been done on this project, as well as the uh, environmental impact SEPA requirements? Sure. Um, uh, we've had two um, community meetings um, concerning the field lighting project at Whitman Middle School. Um, we have previously had um, a community meeting also associated with um, our SEPA. Uh, again, that is a practice that we have suspended and no, no longer are implementing SEPA. Um, those meetings um, primarily became uh, meetings in which, uh, you know, it garnered opposition um, and an individual would lead, you know, would utilize those meetings to garner opposition and so consequ consequently we have suspended those meetings but we did have two uh, community meetings of which it came out and we presented the projects we addressed um, questions and we did address um, community concerns we implemented a traffic uh, analysis to understand um, what the parking would be like uh, we do have a large parking lot at whitman middle school um, and uh, so I feel like we have addressed um, the SEPA. We did have our SEPA appealed. Um, the hearing examiner affirmed the SEPA documents that we did, and there's been no administrative action taken, um, Director Mack. And the administrative action would be in a in a legal setting. The administrative. Uh, Uh, have we heard a lot of community of the neighbors concern around the potential light spillage and um, whether or not that should be a concern or that there may be further, um, uh, I don't know, neighborhood contesting of this project? So the city of Seattle has a very um, rigorous light spill requirement, um, literally point two foot candles at your property line. And we work um, with our lighting consultants to make sure that we are um, well within those um, guidelines. And I will note Musco's uh, lighting project uh, uh, product allows you to direct light so that it is on um, the field at the playing surface and not spilling out beyond the playing surface. So they have a very um, superior product to what else is on the market. Um, I will also note that with um, light emitting diodes or uh, commonly referred to as LED technology, uh, that also has helped um, not have the light spill that you, you used to have with um, the large metal halide lights that were previously utilized. Great, thank you. I don't have any other questions um, at this time. Just wanted to get that onto the record for clarification around those specific points as um, there were some emails and uh, faxes sent asking um, those things. Um, I rest at this point. Thank you, Director Mack. Director Hampson? Uh, no further questions for me at this point. Uh, Director Mack covered them. Thank you. Thank you. Director Rankin? Yep, yeah, same for me. I was going to ask about the email that we received, so thanks for that information. Thank you. Director Devetta Smith? Yeah, likewise. I was I was um, interested in that because we did get the, a couple emails um, <clears throat> patients in regarding this, and honestly, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm less concerned with property values of neighbor. I mean, it's not that's not important, but you know, same, it's the city, it's with growth. Um, what I'm more concerned with is the idea, um, you know, the accusation that that um, this project is not in line with our, um, with the Beck Sky Guiding Principles. So I'm wondering if, um, Richard, if you can offer any, you know, more justification for this being in line with those guiding principles. Uh, Director Rivera Smith, we are working on first. We were working on installing um, field lights at the high school athletic fields throughout the city of Seattle, um, and now we are beginning installing. Having completed the high schools, we're beginning installing field lights at um, our middle schools. And just 
I don't understand where that comment is coming from. From an equity standpoint, we're literally installing field lights um, throughout the district. Um, Mercer Middle School, as I would, would note, would just be done when we replace Mercer Middle School. We're looking at trying to create a field with field lights at that school site. Um, that is potentially a landmarked building, so it could be impacted by that. Um, but uh, Aki Kurosi does not have, that's a parks um, uh, field, um, but that is lit. We have lit Cleveland High School, so I'm not sure where that's coming from. Yeah, um, well, I guess so. I guess I guess you haven't seen the scene, though. I'm sorry. I, mean, I shouldn't assume you've seen it. I think there, the ones that there, this person is specifically um, claiming is that under the guiding principle of um, building conditions and um, educational alignment, that they're claiming that this, that this project is really not consistent with that of serving our students because the idea is that this is mostly to provide lighting hours for Seattle, Public, for, for Seattle Parks Department's use of our fields which isn't directly our students, I guess, and this, that's one of their claims. Another is just about the, um, the financial, the environmental and financial stability principle, because on top of the lighting that we're gonna put in there, we're also committing to clearly the um, energy usage costs, energy management for the system and maintenance costs. Um, and then they did, they did a question about the SEPA, but we talked about that already. And, and I will just note that we do get reimbursed um, for our field use when it's outside, um, uh, when it's scheduled by the community through the parks district, the S Seattle Public Schools does get reimbursed for the lighting costs. Uh, we're trying to provide more access. Um, today, many of our club sports are on parks related fields um, and we're trying to get our club sports back on Seattle Public Schools fields. And one of the ways to do that is to provide opportunities for more, for more access in the nighttime uh, given the change in secondary school times. And so the field lighting projects are um, achieving that objective. <clears throat> Thank you. And so, and then um, again, like I said, the writer wrote about the SEPA, which I know Director Mack already addressed. And you mentioned that there were um, a couple, there were two actual in-person community We did have two yeah. community meetings um, associated with this project, but we did not have a SEPA specific community meeting associated with this project. And then you know the dates of those community meetings? No, but I can get that for you and we can include it in an updated bar and I'll just make a note. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Director Vada Smith. Uh, my question, Mr. Best, is just about, um, you had talked about the two candles uh, length and then who, how do we get uh, approval or uh, I guess, how is the city involved with, you know, giving us a thumbs up that what we've done follows the letter of the law? How do we, is there some so as part of the commissioning process for the field lights, um, Director DeWolf, we will be out there with a foot candle measure, making sure that we comply with uh, city of Seattle's requirements. Uh, understood. I guess what I'm saying is who, who aff affirms that you've, done what you said with, with the candle. Link. We affirm to the city of Seattle that we've done what we said we were going to do. And then if it's questioned, um, they, they will, uh, they have a permit uh, enforcement um, division and they will come out and look to confirm that it is accurate. But we will be taking foot candle measurements at property lines to um, Note that the theoretical is actual is uh, is being complied with in actuality. Thank you, Mr. One, can I enter? Come on, this is Director Rivera Smith. I had one last thing I forgot. I'm sorry. Can I ask for us? It was in relation to uh, Richard. Gonna, he's going to add the dates for those meetings. Could you also, Richard, add the steps you took to ad you guys took to advertise for those meetings so we know how people could have found out about them? Yep. Thank, Thank you. you Okay, and we'll now move to introduction item number 11. This is BEX-5, award construction con contract P5140, bid number B032062 to Field Turf USA for the athletic field improvements at Ballard High School project. This came to the operations committee on April 27th for consideration. Uh, and just a time check for folks, we have about, uh, it's about 4.15 and we have about uh, nine items to go. So Mr. Best, uh, I believe you'll be briefing us. 
Yes, and I'm sorry I scrolled by Ballard High School and went to Nathan Hill. Understood, no worries. Sorry about that. Yep. So uh, Ballard High School, we are recommending uh, awarding the contract to um, field turf. Uh, we are essentially replacing a synthetic field with a synthetic field. The one significant difference is, and again, this is a prior board. Um, I think Director Mack and Director DeWolf, if you're familiar, we now utilize a cork infill in lieu of uh, crumb rubber in our fields, and this will replace the crumb rubber um, synthetic field at Ballard High School with a cork infill um, manufactured by Field Turf. Um, Cost of the project is $663,566. And this is just, it's reached the end of its life. A um, synthetic field lasts about 10 years. And so we do resiliency testing in the ninth and 10th year to kind of look at its longevity as to when it needs to be replaced. And Ballard High Schools uh, needs to be replaced this summer. Understood. Thank you, Mr. Best. I yeah. will start with our operations committee chair, Director Mack, and then call on question question excuse me, on directors uh, for questions and comments and alphabetical order after that. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll just note that the question around why the bid contract documents are not included was answered previously. And um, I don't have any specific questions to this um, other than support for cork versus the other alternative mm -hmm. and um, that having safe uh, fields for our students use is incredibly important. Thank you. Director Hampson. Uh, yeah, thanks for this. I, I remember when the uh, when the board voted to go to um, to cork and uh, I'm just curious. Uh, do, is it too soon to say how it's bearing? I know they started first up on at Cal Anderson. Do we have any sense of whether it's bearing better than the? the we ha we struggled the first year, uh, Director, Director Hampson, um, with maintenance with the court because it's lighter. It needs to get settled into the to the um, you know the turf um, element. Uh, um, but it seems after the first year, I would say the maintenance requirements look very similar to crumb rubber. Our grounds department, you know, um, we now have numerous fields with cork and our grounds department personnel are much uh, more familiar with working with cork. They anticipate the problems that they're going to have the first year. They're proactively out there. Um, working those fields, knowing they have to go to those fields after significant uh, rain events to get the cork back into place. Once it gets settled into the turf, um, we don't have a problem with it, um, you know, rising up again um, after that first year. That's a great question and I appreciate that question, um, but it, it um, our, we haven't had problems. We've been so very- So far so good. Yep, so far so good. And I will okay. note that is also the park district. We do benchmark with the park district on maintenance of our cork fields. That's also their experience. Okay, all right. Um, thank you for that. I know it's important to get those replaced. Uh, a lot of us have spent a lot of time on those on those fields and come home with a lot of that stuff in our clothes and um, they come into our homes and um, stay in your shoes forever. And uh, so anytime we can uh, make it a better and and potentially healthier, safer experience for kids uh, and families. I think it's a good thing. So thank you for this. Thanks, Director Hampson. Director Rankin. Nope, no questions, thanks. Thank you, Director Rivetta Smith. No questions for me, thank you. Thank you, uh, and Mr. Rest, my only question is around, I think what uh, I'm curious about uh, our schools, I imagine that we are not fully capturing the amount of community use as well on these. So do you think that that plays a role in um, how quickly, I guess, these uh, deteriorate or need to be replaced? I, I imagine different parts of the city have um, turf and fields that might be used by community more than others. Um, I, I could just say uh, that the expected life um, 
Well, I'll back up and say synthetic turf fields are utilized about 10 times more than natural grass fields. And the expected life of a synthetic turf field is um, 10 years. Mm -hmm. We monitor uh, for two things. We monitor for turf length, which is important for footing, good footing. And then we also monitor for resiliency. So if, with tackle football, if you get, you know, uh, tackled, you're, um, we know that we have a safe padding in which um, a student or, or a child is going to land on. Um, we we are very conservative um, in those, and we have pretty much followed manufacturers' recommendations. Um, with 10 years, we do have a landscape architect that we work with, DA Hogan Associates, who helps us design these fields as well, is very knowledgeable about turf in which we talk about expectancies. Um, when I first arrived here six years ago, not all of our fields had what they called an an e-layer or elastic layer underneath uh, the fields. We have since moved to getting all of our fields with an e-layer underneath because it does provide a level of safety for student athletes um, that was better than the gravel pad that was permitted um, and only has to be installed once and then um, can be utilized for every synthetic turf field um, Afterwards, you're only replacing the grass, um, but we monitor it pretty closely, Director DeWolf, and 10 years is the longevity. As to whether different areas um, experience, I can say pretty much all fields are pretty heavily utilized. The one I know, and I think it's more because it's new than uh, Cleveland High School's field is seeing a little bit less use. Um, our facilities operations department does a great job of tracking field use. They have a scheduling program um, in school, dude. And so we're able to monitor that use. Thank you, Mr. All right, we'll move on to introduction item number 12, uh, BTA uh, 4 award construction contract K5120, bid number B032063 to coast to coast turf for the athletic field improvements at Nathan Hill High School and Jane Adams Middle School project. This came through the operations committee on April 27th for consideration. Mr. Best, uh, you'll be briefing us again. And again, both these uh, existing fields are synthetic turf. Um, we are replacing uh, them. And again, going from a crumb rubber infill to a cork infill, um, we did have four bids on this project, coast to coast turf was the low bidder. Um, Coast to Coast Turf has done projects um, in the past for Seattle Public Schools, um, and so recommending that they be awarded this contract. I will note that there were two alternates um, that we're also recommending. One of the alternates was to replace um, some of the chain link fence at Jane Adams Middle School that was not in good condition. And then the other alternate was to provide storage sheds for both pole vault and um, pole vault and uh, high jump equipment at Nathan Hale High School. Thank you, Mr. Best. All right, we'll move to Director Mack, who's our operations committee chair first. Uh, this is similar to the previous um, contract, and I don't have any additional questions or comments this time. Thank you, Director Hampson. No questions for me, thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. I'm good, thanks. Thank you, Director Levera Smith. No questions or comments, thank you. Thank you, and none here as well, Mr. Best. We'll now move to introduction item number 13, BEX 5 award construction contract P5146, bid number B012039 to Olympic Peninsula Construction Inc. for the North Beach Elementary School, Sacagawea Elementary School, and Jane Adams Middle School Pavement Repairs Project. This came to the Operations Committee on April 27th for consideration. Mr. Best, you'll be briefing us again. So, this is an area uh, all three schools have um, asphalt that's in very poor condition. Two of the schools, North Beach Elementary School and Sacagawea, it is the playgrounds. 
Um, this will be pulverizing the existing asphalt and then uh, implementing some stormwater system repairs and then putting an asphalt overlay over um, that pulverized asphalt uh, to create a smooth surface in which um, students can play on. At Jane Adams Middle School, the asphalt uh, repairs are in the northwest parking lot. Um, and again, it is to address alligatored and heaved asphalt. Um, again, we're um, pulverizing the existing asphalt. We're implementing stormwater repairs and then putting an asphalt overlay over that new crushed surface. So um, Olympic Peninsula was the low responsive bidder. Um, we had one um, alternate here. Uh, to do some work underneath the covered place structure, and we're recommending acceptance of that as well. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Okay. Moved first to Director Mack, who is our Operations Committee Chair. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I, I just want to note that this, for this, these projects in particular, um, the importance of getting them moving. That uh, as part of X five. Uh, when we were going through the process of selecting uh, projects and um, identified various areas in schools that actually wouldn't end up on Bex 5 in total, um, there were some safety issues uh, recognized, and these um, this is one of them. Um, and so I'm grateful for this pro these projects moving forward because uh, the pavement in on these schools is uh, is a safety hazard at this point. And so moving forward on getting these done um, uh, increases the uh, uh, safety for our students and access for um, uh, uh, those with disabilities as well. So um, no other questions or comments. Thank you, Mr. Best, for continuing to move these uh, projects forward. Thank you, Director Mack. Next, we'll have Director Hampson. Um, yeah, is there um, anything, will, will there be any, any, I'm sorry, any increased accessibility um, coming with this project? Um, I would say, I would echo what Director Mack said, the condition of these asphalt play areas is very, very poor, and implementing these repairs will make it easier um, for students with disabilities to, you know, uh, utilize the playground. Um, and I will also note this, we, we are out um, as part of our facilities condition assessment um, uh, process for this year, collecting information about the condition of our asphalt play areas so that we can address this um, and have a replacement schedule um, for all of our schools. And it, but does this extend, are, is, are the transitions um, being affected at all? Are they being improved or is it just the, um, the enclosed kind of space of asphalt the, that is the playground? Yeah, these areas will meet um, ADA requirements, um, Director Hampson. Okay, so from sidewalks and yep. parking lots and all that. Okay, okay, yep. thank we're, you. We're required to meet those. Okay. Thank you, Director Hampson. Director Rankin. No questions. Thank you, Director Devetta Smith. Hi, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, no questions. I, I appreciate the, the adding of the locations. I know that in committee it was asked, I asked, I think I asked where those, where they were going to be. And so thank you for, um, including the location so we can see exactly where we're talking about these schools. I agree, the asphalt is in bad, bad need of repair. Um, I know personally at Sacagawea, um, the playground there. So thank you for that. Um, no other questions. Thank you. Uh, and I have no questions at this time for you, Mr. Best, okay. on this item. So we'll now move to introduction item number 14, 2020, 2020 through 2022, Fran's Family Bakery two-year bread agreement renewal. This came to the operations committee on May 14th for approval. And uh, joining us today is Director of Nutrition Services, Aaron Smith. And uh, before we begin, I do wanna deeply apologize. I know we're about an hour and a half past our uh, time and I appreciate your, 
your patience, uh, and I will let you jump in with uh, your briefing. All right. Uh, thank you, Director DeWolf. Uh, today, VAR is for the renewal of the contract with Franz Family Bakery for two additional years, covering the period from September 1st, 2020 to August 31st, 2022. USDA guidelines requires that we offer five different components to students uh, for their meals, a grain, protein, fruit, vegetable, and milk. This contract will put us in compliance for the grain category. Uh, the bread products are used for breakfast, lunch, and summer meals. All products are made in a nut-free facility. This year, France has provided reliable service um, and has received a satisfactory evaluation. They've also shown flexibility with their deliveries and service during this time. It is in the best interest of the district for us to continue working with a local company, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Director Smith. Uh, we'll now move to Director's questions and comments, starting with Director Mack, who is our Operations Committee Chair. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, this came to ops and was late. We were late, a half hour late on that agenda, so again, appreciate uh, staff Sticking around to do this important work. Um, and I also appreciate the noting that this um, uh, bakery is a nut free uh, bakery, uh, which is important for the safety of our students with nut allergies in our district. Um, and uh, I have no other further questions or comments at this time. Thank you, Director Mack. Director Hanson. Hampson. I'm super glad that we have a local company that we can contract with. Um, I, I've got a house full of Franz um, <laughs> bread, and uh, it, you know, I, I, we don't have a lot of opportunities like this in a in a city that is is largely um, limited in terms of any kind of manufacturing. Um, so I think it's it's a great um, partnership, and um, I support it. Thank you. Thanks, Director Hampson. Director Rinkin. Nope, I don't have any questions, um, but I, I also want to just um, restate what I said in committee, which was my just deep thanks and appreciation for Mr. Smith and the whole nutrition services team and their ability to pivot to uh, serving students in a wholly different way mm -hmm. um, during this time and then continuing with keeping up with, uh, you know, businesses, businesses needed to continue. So um, thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. Director Devetta Smith. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I would love a future in which we can bake fresh bread for our students. I know that's not happening anytime soon, but so I'm glad we do have a relationship with a local bakery that we can get our breads from. So thank you for all the work here. And no questions or comments. Thank you. I have no other questions for you as well, uh, Director Smith, but um, I just want to highlight at least the fact that, uh, to Director Rankin's point, the ability to quickly pivot and now, sir, uh, around 36,000 lunches a week is quite uh, huge. So thank you for the work and thank you to your team. Uh, and if you're lucky enough to be in District 5, where I, uh, rep I represent you, um, sometimes depending on the way the wind blows, you can hear, you can see, you can smell Franz Bakery from, from all over. Um, so now we will move to introduction item number 15. This is BEX 5, award contracts P1745, P1747. P1748, P1746, bingo. <laughs> uh, to Building Envelope Technology and Research Inc, BET and R, for technical consultation services for design oversight and on site construction observation of the building envelope, exterior cladding systems, and roofing systems for the Kimball, Northgate, Ulins, and West Seattle Elementary Schools projects. This came to the Operations Committee on May 14th for approval. Mr. Best, you'll be briefing us again. Yes. So I combined the uh, four contracts into one bar, um, and uh, they're all for similar work uh, related to the building envelope and then roofing systems. Um, this is really uh, Seattle Public Schools quality control, quality assurance that our building envelopes and roofing systems, um, when designed and when built, uh, will perform as anticipated. Um, we have historically had some 
problems on prior projects. I think uh, Director Mack and Director DeWolf, you might be aware that um, we have replaced the roof at um, Ballard School, and then obviously we're having some issues also at Rising Star Elementary School related to the roofing system. So, uh, uh, Director of uh, Facilities Operations, Frank Griffin, and myself have put together a quality control, quality assurance program to make sure that our building envelopes um, perform as anticipated, that they do not leak, that we do not have moisture intrusion problems in our schools, um, and to make sure that um, there are not mold issues related with those moisture intrusion problems. Um, Director Griffin had two of his foremen participate, the glazing foreman, um, Ed Dayton, and then his roofing foreman, Brian Z, on the selection committee, bet &R, was selected as the technical consultant. And then Director Griffin and I developed the scope of work that you see actually associated with these contracts. Um, scope of work includes both design input and reviewing the design documents prior to going to bid, uh, participating in the bid award phase to let contractors know that this is a very serious um, uh, area and for Seattle Public Schools and then to let them uh, to have the work observed um, on a half time basis as the different exterior cladding systems and roofing systems are being built um, for Seattle Public Schools. We anticipate from the scope of work that this is uh, that there will be a representative on site 50% um, of the time while um, these uh, work activities are are um, occurring. Um, when you look at cladding, you got to think of both um, the exterior wall envelope, but then you also have to think about below grade. Um, we know that Kimball Elementary School, Viewlands, and West Seattle all are are sites with a fair amount of topography. Um, they all have a fair amount of hydrology at those sites when you read the geotechnical reports. And so that below grade waterproofing is critically important to keep out of the um, um, uh, occupied spaces. And then Northgate Elementary School, <laughs> while it doesn't have um, uh, a significant amount of topography, it does have a large retaining wall on that site. And so again, we are going to have some um, uh, low grade uh, waterproofing required um, there at that um, new retaining wall that we'll be constructing. And so I'm gonna open it up for questions. Thank you, Mr. We'll start with uh, Director Mack, who's our operations committee chair. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Best and your team for uh, putting together this work to um, uh, ensure that the construction projects are sound and the roofing systems and that we do not, the build, building envelopes, et cetera, do not um, have problems in the future. Uh, it's, as you know, uh, and I think it was maybe Director Rankin who said this at the during ops that it's the worst to have um, rain coming down on your head in school, um, and that this work and these contracts will uh, mitigate that risk in our buildings and ensure that we have safe environments for our students going forward. Um, so thank you, and I don't have any additional comments or questions at this time. Thanks, Director Mack. Director Hampson. No questions for me, thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. Um, yeah, just uh, echoing what Director Mack said, um, uh, what what I had mentioned was that, um, you know, rain leaking through tiles or something is one thing, but uh, the bigger sort of invisible issue that can happen is moisture that builds up between, um, between the interior wall and the exterior wall and in, um, overhead space between the at or between the ceiling and the roof and then um, that can cause you know mold and all kinds of stuff so um, 
uh, it's super, super critical for the health and safety of our of our students that that this work is done in a, in a you know if, if um, the the technical part is is actually different expertise and different issues than uh, the physical building of a roof. So um, uh, yeah, I think we've seen with um, uh, the um, Rising Star building. Um, it, whoops, sorry. Issues that can happen with uh, uh, roof roofing and moisture uh, not cooperating. So, thank, thank you, Director Rick and Director Devetta Smith. No questions for me. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and I have no questions as well, Mr. Best. So we'll move to uh, introduction item number sixteen. This is Bex Five Distress School Grant and K through K through three Class Size Reduction Grant. Award construction contract P5149 for bid number B012049 to Allied Construction Associates Inc. for the West Woodland Elementary Addition and Modernization Project. This came to the Operations Committee on May 14th for consideration. Mr. Best, back to you. Thank you, um, Director DeWolf. Um, so we received uh, six bids uh, for West Woodland Elementary School. Um, addition and modernization um, uh, project. We are adding 12 classrooms and a gymnasium to the West Woodland Elementary School. We'll be repurposing their existing gymnasium for a commons area, and then we will be doing a light touch to the existing building in replacing some um, some of their existing carpets, some of their existing is um, providing some new technology so that it's consistent throughout all the buildings and all the classrooms look the same, and then providing some consistent um, communication pathways as well. Um, we're recommending that this um, contract be awarded to Allied Construction and Associates, um, and we are also needing a budget transfer of $1.7 million from the BEX-5 program contingency. Um, I will note that uh, um, some of these classrooms were funded through the case K3 class size reduction grant, and then also the other classrooms that are not um, funded from the K3 class size reduction grant were, were funded from stress school grant. Um, we'll be able to uh, relocate seven portable off this site um, when uh, this work is complete. Everybody will be back within um, the building and we will um, be able to uh, utilize those portables elsewhere in Seattle Public Schools um, system. Thank you, Mr. Best. All right, we'll start with Director Mack, Operations Committee Chair. Yes, thank you, Mr. Best, for the overview. Um, uh, I think I just would note for the public that there's extensive conversation about this project and the uh, the design review happened in ops and those uh, that PowerPoint and the minutes can be reviewed. Um, Mr. Best, can you do you remember which ops meeting that was? What date that was? Uh, I don't, but I can have it added to this bar. Um, when it comes back for you before you for approval, Director Mac. Yeah, I think that might be helpful to um, you know be able to point folks back to um, that meeting, that presentation where a lot of the conversation took place, and um, that'd be useful for the, for the bar and maybe actually uh, similar similar bars going forward. Um, Yep. It might be a good addition just to have as a background on um, on the projects. Um, so I don't have any additional questions at this time. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks, Director Mack. Director Hampson. No questions for me. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. No questions. Thanks. Thank you, Director Avada Smith. No questions for me. Thank you. Thank you, and I have no questions for you on this item, Mr. Best. So we'll now move to introduction item number 17, BTA 4 slash OSPI School Construction Assistance Program slash Stressed Schools Grant 
resolution 2019-20-30, acceptance of the building commissioning report for the Magnolia, Magnolia Elementary School renovation and addition project. This came to the operations committee on May 14th for approval. Mr. Best, you'll be briefing us again. Yes. So um, your acceptance and then passage of the resolution is required by OSPR um, for our release of retainage. It's part of the closeout process. Being, um, is a systematic process in which we test the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems to make sure that they are indeed functioning as designed. Um, we have an coordinator, um, Mike McBee was heavily involved in this project, and then Mike Kennedy has taken on um, the very end uh, closeout of this project with the commissioning agent to make sure all the items that were identified needed um, correction. Correct. I will note that the irrigation system had been turned off. It is now back functioning. Who has been commissioned? Um, that was an exception that was uh, noted in EEI's letter um, on on this project. But to make the board members aware that that has been corrected or has been tested now and it is functioning as designed. Uh, commissioning, I will also note, is required by the city of Seattle and it needs to be done by a third party commissioning agent. EEI was the commissioning agent uh, for this project. I will also note that C uh, Seattle Public School Mechanical Electrical Plum Coordinators are both very strong at uh, making sure that these building systems are indeed functioning in the manner in which they were originally intended. And they literally have involvement from the very uh, beginning of the project all the way through to the, through to the end. Usually the commissioning agent comes on at the uh, end of um, the construction documents, bid award phase and oversees um, the construction phase. So. Um, Mike McBee and Mike Kennedy's um, involvement is uh, is very much welcome for capital projects and planning. So, thank you. Thank you. To questions. Thank you, Mr. Best. All right, we'll start with Director Mack, Operations Committee Chair. Uh, just want to uh, underscore the comments around the importance and thoroughness of this part of the process, the commissioning, and how. Um, it's a uh, dot in the I's and crossing the T's to make sure everything works well and um, happy to see this coming forward on this project. Thank you. Thank you. Director Hampson. No questions from me. Thank you. Thank you. Director Rankin. Um, nope. Sorry. <laughs> I came outside for it to be quieter and now there have been sirens every 15 minutes. So yeah, no, I don't have any questions, but sorry for the noise. Thank you. No worries. Director Nevada Smith. No questions for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I have none uh, here as well, Mr. Best, and we'll move to introduction item number 18 as well with you. And it is BTA 4, approval of construction change order number 12 for the Webster School modernization and addition projects. This came to the operations committee on May 14th for approval. One last time, Mr. Best. So this is uh, approval of change order number 12, as you indicated, Director DeWolf. Um, this is really four items uh, that are totaling $479,808. Board policy, you have to approve um, these change orders. Um, the four items are for, uh, for, for the establishment um, where we remove the existing um, covered 1930s covered play area. There was a substantial amount of damage to the existing brick that we were not able to see at the time we were uh, there to the demolition of that co uh, covered play area. We're asking for approval to repair that and um, put brick back in that area. Um, the concrete base has also um, was uh, very much worn. Uh, with the covered play area construction, we're asking for approval to um, reestablish that concrete base on the north building, uh, put a water repellent and a graffiti coating on the masonry, 
and then um, to implement structural repairs to the cornice. Um, when we uh, demolished the existing roof, we were able to uh, then look at the condition of the framing for the cornice. The cornice is actually a sheet metal cornice with wood framing. It is not terracotta or stone. Um, and that wood framing had obviously been exposed to a significant amount of storm water. It was, um, you had a substantial amount of rot. And so we're recommending um, that it, uh, well, it needs to be um, repaired uh, because it's a landmark building. We don't really have a lot of options. We have to repair the cornice in the manner in which it was originally um, constructed. And so we're recommending approval of for the Webster School. Thank you, Mr. Best. We'll start with Director Mack, Operations Committee Chair. Uh, just uh, just to note that old buildings um, are difficult to uh, know what you're going to uncover uh, in renovation, and um, it, it's unfortunate, but costs get incurred. But again, the safety of our students is paramount, and uh, uh, this change order reflects uh, work that needs to be done in order to make the building safe. And um, also just want to note that uh, the school is uh, delayed in its overall opening uh, from the original um, expectation um, due to uh, the situation around um, COVID, et cetera. Um, and if Mr. Best, you could note in this um, bar also the, uh, the when we had the design review for the Webster School Modernization Project, that'd be helpful. Um, uh, no other thoughts or questions at the time. Thank you. Director Hampson? No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Director Rankin? None for me. Thank you. Director Levera? None. Thank you very much. Thank you, and none for me, Richard, and thank you so much for your patience. Uh, I know we've been over uh, a considerable amount of time, uh, but obviously we had a lot of good conversations today. So now we'll move to board comments section of the agenda. Just to remind directors, we are at 451, so um, I'll move uh, alphabetically through the list, but um, please try to keep your comments as brief as possible. Um, but obviously, uh, you're free to do what you'd like. We'll start with Director Hampson. Hi, uh, just to... Um Keep it short. I, I want to go all the way back to the beginning of the meeting and echo my support for um, the resolution to recognize um, the first uh, Wednesday, I believe in June, as um, uh, uh, gun safety um, day, and I will be supporting that. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that um, gun violence um, includes uh, violence perpetrated by police and um, that it's been a, I know it's been a rough week uh, already um, for um, all the reasons that, that come with uh, the coronavirus, uh, people are under tremendous amount of stress, and now with the um, uh, recent um, murder in uh, Minneapolis um, of a black male um, who represents um, the, the students that, that we are working so hard to center um, and eliminating um, racial um, bias and practices in our own education system, it makes the work that much more um, paramount. And um, it's uh, I, it, it's a, a tough time, but I will um, I use that that opportunity to recognize that um, that is one of um, the worst indicators of of how badly we need uh, gun safety. Um, in our schools and um, elsewhere, and that, that it's there's some deeply embedded um, uh, racism that that is at the heart of that. So, um, with that, I will pass it along. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Hampson. Director Mack. Um, I will echo uh, uh, Director Hampson's comments around support for. 
the gun violence uh, safety resolution, um, we first adopted one in 2017, um, and it is incredibly distressing that we are uh, not making much progress um, in this area. So uh, happy to stand up and support every effort um, that we can uh, to increase safety um, of our students and our community. Um, I also just want to share with uh, my fellow directors and the public around um, the uh, WASDA legislative or uh, legislative advocacy process that's going on. As you all know, I sit on the legislative committee for the Washington State School Directors Association. And um, even in this time of uh, meeting slowdown, the, the work is continuing. Um, the Position proposals have been submitted. Uh, deadline was May 20th. Those can come from any director, um, school district, um, and uh, we'll be considering those in all the meetings Friday and Saturday uh, that we'll be conducting via Zoom um, to review the proposals. Uh, these proposals, if they get uh, moved forward will be considered by the full WASDA uh, uh, organization at Ledge Assembly, uh, which is in the fall. And I apologize for not having the date at this time, but um, we have the opportunity as a board if we would like to potentially go back and sponsor any of those proposals um, uh, later on. And we also have the opportunity to vote them up or down when they come in front of the full assembly. Um, and uh, so just wanted to uh, bring that to your all attention. Um, and also, uh, I just want to give a shout out to all parents, guardians, students um, that are managing life during this time and, um, you know, the challenges that it, that it, that it has. Uh, one thing that I'm noticing is that it's, um, increasing the amount of time we need to spend writing and communicating in email um, and how important it is for us to, as a district, uh, continue to focus our efforts on literacy um, and and those sorts of things um, because it's becoming so much more uh, critically important uh, for communication and access uh, to community. Um, and with that, uh, thank you. And thank you all for working through all this really important um, meeting, even though we're a couple hours over time, unfortunately. Uh, you know, we're continuing to move the work forward that needs to move forward for our students and community. Um, and I appreciate all of you. And um, thank you. Wash your hands, Thank like the governor you. says. <laughs> Thank you, Director Matt. Great reminder. Director Rankin. Yeah, thanks. Um, I um, also am absolutely supportive of the uh, the statement for to support uh, the Gun Violence Awareness Day. And uh, for anyone wanting to participate or show support, the uh, request from um, the community groups that uh, organize that is to wear orange. Um, so I will definitely be signing that in my capacity as a individual board director. Um, uh, with that too, uh, something that director Rivera Smith and I had been, um, uh, looking into before COVID, uh, required us to cease things that were not necessary and routine, um, was, uh, adopting a, or looking at a resolution that had been adopted by districts in Colorado and California um, supporting the uh, inclusion of information about local safe gun storage laws in uh, first day packets. So um, that is something that I hope we can resume again because uh, not to, you know, as school board directors, we can't do anything um, to change state legislation, but we can support our families by uh, reminding people or, um, ensuring that they know what the safe gun storage laws are, um, because as we know, uh, access to firearms greatly increases the likelihood of there being um, gun violence. Uh, so, uh, and also 
have been speaking to Chief Jesse um, about sending health and safety information out to our families during the closure, including um, mental health and uh, mental health resources, domestic abuse resources, and uh, gun safety information and resources. So, um, uh, yeah, definitely support this this day of of increasing awareness and protecting our communities. Um, uh, two more quick things are uh, there's there's a special education document that um, is a technical staff document and um, I've asked uh, Concy uh, Dr. Pedroza for a family version of that that should be ready and has gone before legal to be shared out. Um, there's a question about middle school silence that I'm also uh, getting information from Dr. Pedrosa about. And I just wanted to really quickly thank um, Heidi for uh, telling us about Let's Talk and just note that she very um, graciously allowed me an hour of her time yesterday to show me the different features of it. And it's something that I think would help us in our communication and uh, serving our families a lot better. So I just wanted to bring our attention back to that and say thanks. Thank you, Director Rankin. Director Devetta-Smith. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll keep it short. Uh, of course, I want to just thank uh, Superintendent Juno for um, recognizing and proclaiming the first Friday of June to be National Gun Violence Awareness Day for Seattle Public Schools. Um, so thankful for her doing that, and uh, I'm happy to sign on to that in my personal uh, capacity. Um, it is, it, it's, it's important to recognize that the the victims of gun violence are not just the people who are actually taking bullets, but the families and loved ones and friends and the, the wider community um, who suffers through this. So um, recognition and attention on that is valuable and needed. Uh, I'm glad that Director Rankin mentioned the um, efforts we were working on before COVID to get the gun, safe gun storage um, policy or, or resolution on our board. And her and I, I believe, or I know I am, I think she is too, we're both going to be attending um, they're having a virtual gala. They had to take it virtual because of COVID, and that's on June 1st. So um, you can find out more, anyone who's interested, about the Alliance for um, Gun Responsibility. Is Their website's pretty easy. It's gunresponsibility.org. So uh, you can look up there and find out what's, what their efforts are. Uh, and for everybody, I am hoping to learn more there, and um, anyone else who wants to join in is welcome. So thank you again. Uh, have a good night. Thank you, Director Devetta Smith. Uh, and, and my only comments today are uh, thank you, everybody, for your patience and grace as we move through a, a little bit longer than normal uh, meeting. But I also wanted to elevate the fact that today we lost a pretty big champion in the queer LGBTQ community, uh, Larry Kramer, who led the vocal movement to fight and elevate uh, the public health crisis known as HIV and AIDS in the 80s when the rest of the country was ignoring these calls, uh, has died. And I just wanted to read a little portion from the strangers uh, article today about him this morning the new york times led their obituary of larry kramer by noting that his abusive approach overshadows his his overshadows his achievements but neither abusive nor confrontational really captured kramer's approach i often think about how reagan's white house laughed openly about the idea of queer death during the worst years of the epidemic that dismissive attitude, one might call it an abusive approach, captures a horrible political cruelty from which it is sometimes feels there's no escape. There are those for whom the suffering of others is a funny trifle as long as it's the others who are suffering. It feels so easy to give up on caring, to resign ourselves to the cruelty, to expect it, to decide there's no point to resisting. Larry never, never gave up. It wasn't just the cruelty that made him mad. It was the idea that we have no choice but to take it. With that, I have no further comments and thank you all again for uh, uh, joining us today on this extra long meeting and I will, uh, we will talk to you very soon. This meeting is now officially adjourned at 5.02 p.m. because there's no further business uh, and thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, good night, good, or good night. evening. Thank you everybody. <laughs>